Truth Seeker and or its affiliates are not responsible for any strange phenomena that may occur during or after listening to this podcast, which may include the following. Heightened senses of awareness, psychic abilities, UFO sightings, alien contact, time loss, out-of-body experiences, ringing in the ears, ESP, lucid dreaming, increased synchronicities, astral projection, telepathy, stronger intuition, levitation, miraculous healings, and or remote viewing. Please be advised to listen at your own discretion. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? I'm your host, Truth Seeker. This is the Truth Seeker Podcast. Thank you guys for hanging out with us on this beautiful day. So we got a good show lined up. We're going to get into some interesting conversations with our guest today, Ed Roman of edroman.net. So this is going to be some good information, hopefully get into some paranormal stories, topics, conversation, spirituality, and uh, talk about some music and stuff as well, which is very near and dear to my heart. So it should be a good conversation lined up for you guys today. Uh, I want to start this conversation off by uh, thanking all the patrons who support my work and enable me to do this. You guys are the enablers. So uh, everybody supporting my work over at patreon.com backslash truth seeker. I um, want to give a shout out to Miguel Carmona, The Lucid Story, Mad Magic, which this is Philip with the Mad Magic Podcast who became a patron. Thank you, brother. Uh, five to nine, Zine which is or zine however you say that well i believe it's david who uh has been supporting my work as well and uh, they're going to be interviewing me in their uh next edition of five to nine zine zine i don't know how to online magazine and i think they print them out too so they're going to be interviewing me doing a write-up here this month so that's going to be cool make sure y'all check out their website um who else we got here let me sweep to in uh yeah i think that's it so yeah, thank you guys for coming aboard, joining the family and supporting my work. If you want to do that, head on over to patreon.com backslash true seeker. And uh, there you get access to my entire, entire discography, which is 10 plus albums, um, all the new music that I'm working on. I just uploaded a new song that I'm working on, getting some feedback from you guys. That's up there. And um, so you kind of get a behind the scenes look as I'm working on stuff as well over there. You get access to um, unreleased interviews, extra podcast, and Thursday night School of the Mystics. You get access to that as well. That's the community side of the podcast and what we're building. So if that interests you, head on over to patreon.com backslash true seeker and uh, sign up for any level of giving. And there's a bunch of cool stuff that you get for supporting my work and you enable me to do this full time. So thank you guys for that. Um, so without further ado, we're going to bring the guest in, Ed Roman. Brother, welcome to the podcast. What's going on? Derek, thanks for having me. Everything and nothing, like I said, you know, working on a new video and uh, and happy to bring it to people in a very short period of time. Awesome, man. So me, when I do these interviews, I like to just jump right in to the juicy stuff. But I've I've set up several conversations and it will let me give some background information about who I am first. So I'll set it up, but then they, they won't even answer. They want to give some background information. So let people know who you are, man. I know you're a singer songwriter and uh, you're accomplished. Let people know who you are and what you bring to the table with your music endeavors. Well, thanks again. I mean, um, 
I've been playing music probably as long as you have. It's like a lifelong pursuit. And uh, I fell in love with stringed instruments at a young age, uh, you know, started playing guitar, but then everybody got in at high school and, you know, needed a bass player. Hmm. Uh, I took it on as a challenge. Somebody passed me a Jock the Pistorius record when I was 14 and it sort of changed my life. And But storytelling and songwriting has always been a part of that. And, you know, being a bass player in a band, sometimes you end up with all the instruments in your jam spot or your basement or your bedroom. <laughs> and uh, I started dabbling I, on drums and keyboards. And I, obviously I kept playing guitar and stuff. So I'm, I'm sort of a multi-instrumentalist, but I'm a bass player by trade. But as I said, like a storyteller. And everybody asked me to describe my music. You know, they were always looking to put something in some kind of a genre or whatever. I always call it kitchen sink. It's it's a little bit of everything. On, on the records, you're going to hear some funk, and you're going to hear some folk, and you're going to hear some country, and you're going to hear some jazz, and you're going to hear instrumental pieces and spoken word and comedy numbers and anything that sort of comes across my sort of spark initiation of writing. I follow. I've, I, I, I've heard some really interesting statements from like Tom Waits and Keith Richards over the last number of years that say, you know, that initial idea is one thing. It's the it's the epiphany. But then allowing the experience to pull you through it creates a, a whole new mix up of ideas and feelings. And, and, and that's where kind of genres can kind of cross meld. So, I, you know, it, it behooves me. Uh, and, and who am I not to follow those kinds of things? So. Uh, that's what I get off on in music is is that is that cross pooling of information. Really, that's why we have a lot of the amazing music we have in our historical past and stuff that's happening today. Yeah, it's like just this big eclectic taste of all of this good music, and it's it's cool because like I think as the genres expand, um, you have the blend of hip hop and, and metal and you have rap core or new metal and, and, and country and, and rap and all of these. Uh, and, and yeah. And so, th uh, that's even big now the, the, whole, the whole country rap thing. That's a whole genre that's blowing up. Country rap is blowing up right now. There's a huge market in it. And some of the people who are just kind of standing out in that genre are blowing up because they're kind of like some of the people who are doing it and doing it good. And we just see these, these, um, genres begin to form as these styles kind of come together and make something new we look at like in the rock scene we look at lincoln park you know what i'm saying and what they brought to the table and kind of you know something being that big that fast and then blowing up to where like everybody steps back from it eventually and says, <laughs> oh we're not going to touch that anymore whether it's you know um some of the the uh hair band music now it's kind of hard like that that stuff is what it is for like bringing back memories and bringing us back to that time. But as far as bands that are still trying to do that kind of stuff, it it's, doesn't really pick up a new audience. It's for those people, but it's cool to see uh, when, when these genres fuse together and burst something new out of them. Have you been a part of any of that? I'm sure you have. If you're, if you like a, a lot of types of music and then you perform and play a lot of types of music, eventually, like you said, you have an album or a song that's, little country, little jazz, little funk, all put together. Red Hot Chili Peppers, perfect example, you know? Yeah, look, and, you know, people have been doing it for a long time and sometimes gotten a lot of criticism for it. Look, Run DMC and Aerosmith. Yeah. I mean, that changed a whole bunch of people. Like, what? Like, hard rock mixed with rap. Like, this is pretty cool. It was a neat idea. And you got some historical significance because the tune was such a hit many years ago but at the same time the video you know, too that, that, yeah the video was huge yeah. right and everybody breaking through the speakers and like it was <laughs> i i love that and and again it's it's change that is the constant you know as as much as we say we're this kind of a musician or that kind of a band or whatever we're always going through some kind of a change and the fans that you know really latch on sometimes to that era or that genre of music when all of a sudden a new change comes it can be like whoa David Bowie is a classic example of all these transformations that he made for so many years. Yeah. As a result, Willie Nelson, he was pegged as a country artist. I mean, he wrote crazy. Uh, but at the same time, later on, when he cut the record, what was it? Stardust, the record company gave him all this flack because they were American songbook classics. They said it will never fly and it became one of his biggest selling records. 
So, uh, you know, I, I think that's the other thing. Artists themselves don't want to be the, sitting in one area that they want to grow. And as a result, you have to branch out and start thinking, well, let's play with this. Let's have fun with it because we're having fun with it. And the audience is obviously going to feel the translation. It's hard to like sit back and think about what's next in music, you know, and I guess unless you're creating it, like, but, to, but to think of, of all the, the different types of music and the genres that we have out now and what's the big thing, it's hard. I don't know if it's a, like a, like a, a rehash of some of the old stuff, bringing it back and putting a new spin on it. I think that can be done, but as far as creating something new, it, it almost feels like it's, it's all been done. But I think it, it may have always felt like that until something new with a different sound comes out, right? Well, that's just it. And I think a big part of it sometimes, too, if you look over history, presentation has also changed so much in terms of the way that we re-release music or uh, we show music in some kind of a way. And a lot of times character is, is tied into that. I mean, some of the people that, you know, I, I mentioned Tom Waits. Uh, you know, he may not be a billboard classic, but I love listening to him because he he creates this whole picture. Uh, every song may have a different flavor and color to it and album to album. But that sort of rusty, rustic voice that's telling stories pulls you into these other fantasyful sort of things. So, uh, again, it's like that's why I gravitate to anything that he does, because he has that that sort of sound. That feeling. I know I'm gonna. I know I'm gonna be taken down a strange road by Tom. You know, he's he's got his voice, and he's, you know, you're under a bridge somewhere in France on a tricycle, arguing with one another, smoking old cigars. You know that you found in a ditch somewhere. You know, he's gonna do those kinds of things, and 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 I, and and it just pulls you out of your normal framework. Mm -hmm. I think music has that ability in any way, and people through those eras project. Look at Louis Armstrong. I mean, you can't help but look at Louie play, sing, and talk and not laugh, giggle, chuckle, and, and get some kind of a feel. When you see somebody like, you know, Hendrix, who had a personality that was extruding through his instrument, you know, and who was very abashed when it came to actually cutting vocals. You listen to Eddie Kramer talk about their sessions at Electric Ladyland. He's like, yeah, I used to have to put up a screen because he didn't want anybody seeing him cutting his lyrics. Mm. And, you know, I think, but then all the self-expression and explosion coming out through his instrument made everybody go, what? Another era of change. You know, uh, some of the stuff that like, like Peter Gabriel, so theatrical and the music that he did and how he related it as it came out over so many years, people were like expecting this sort of like, Jeff Rotal had that same thing. Yeah. Ian Anderson, the strange piper, you know, wearing the cod piece. It was like, it, 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 the, those things too, I think, are highly defined by the, the culture in the moment. You know, uh, Herbie Hancock once said, "The definition of an artist is one who has the ability to fuse their life with the rhythm of the times." <laughs> when it comes to this uh, music that uh, has has stood the test of time, and it, this kind of opens up the door for like the the whole spiritual side of this, um, or the the drug influence side of this. A lot of this great music was from people who I don't were on drugs, who frequently used drugs. We got some really good eclectic music out of it. I mean, you could just start naming bands, whether I mean anything, Alice in Chains, Nirvana, the whole grunge scene, all of it, man. All of it is is definitely drenched in addiction. Uh, scraping the bottom of the barrel and, and drug use and things like that, whether there's a spiritual side to the drug use um, or just someone creating out of desperation or, or what, whatever the case is. But some of that stuff that uh, you feel a piece of those people in the song, what do you think it is with drug use and creating songs, whether it's recreational or addiction, like bottom of the barrel stuff? I think it goes in many directions. It's multi tentacle. Like I mean, the addiction side of it is is the overuse of what that is. I mean, mystics of the past and even in Tibet today in temples, they use hashish and other things that are like that as a part of that release of the, the mortal coil in order to understand more of the metaphysical. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of amazing musicians and, and songs and art that has all come from those forms of recreational use. And 
I think it says even more about our detachment from what spirituality really is, because so many of us uh, and, and of those that don't play, let's say, look at those people in those moments or listen to those songs and understand there's something more than just writing the tune. The, the message and the energy that's being captured because of that person's endeavor. I mean, uh, even years ago, my mom would sing me that song, Old Bill Jones. You know, Old Bill Jones had a daughter and his son. His son went to college, his daughter ran round. His wife got killed in a pool room fight, but still he keeps singing from morning to night, you know? <laughs> the, 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 those kinds of bit, things based on sorrow through yeah. our life experiences are always somehow being circumvented through art. Um, I think that there's a lot of things that, that you know, p day to day people don't have those vents. Alcohol, drugs and things are, are things that they still use. But at the same time, on a spiritual level, you know, and that's why yes, they call you know, moonshine and things like that spirits because <laughs> yeah, that aspect right. of the individual all of a sudden changes mm -hmm. and they're going to let it all flow because there's, there's so much conditioning inside of our experiences, <laughs> people that make us go, well, I can't say that I shouldn't behave that way. I shouldn't do those kinds of things. And then all of a sudden you've had a few snappers and you're loosed up and you're going to let everybody know that you love them. That should kind of be there always. And I think that says something greater about our detachment from spirituality. Yeah. Um, we look at people like Jimi Hendrix or um, people who it's, it's weird. Like the instrument is an expression. Um, the voice is an expression as well. It's an, it's an instrument for, for singers and, and for it's, it's cool because I look at like what the Bible would call a psalmist like uh, King David, he had power when he would play the stringed instruments. And so it was like what was deep down within him was released through the song and through the vibration of the stringed instrument. It's almost like a projector of his spirit and, and his relationship with God or the spirit realm or whatever. And uh, we see psalmists who do that. We see people who just play the instrument without saying nothing. You get chills you may cry like they like they're able to talk without saying words. And it was what we would call psalmist. And look at the power of music, the spiritual power of music. It, it always goes back. The whole King David thing reminds me of um, Pythagoras as well. When you get into some stuff that uh, his work and um, what stands out for the King David part is the fact that um, King Saul was overcome with demons, possessed with demons. He was vexed. And the only way that he would find solace is when David, the psalmist, played the string instrument over him. And it said the evil spirits that were tormenting Saul would leave as he played the guitar. And I think we see that now, like we if we're in a state of confusion or in a place of sorrow. We can put on some uplifting music, some soft music where people who are able to communicate this beautiful message or negative message that that's being done as well. Or if you're trying to get out violence and rage and there's release there too, but the spiritual aspect to it, that something is happening when these people create music. Well, yeah, it's, you're hundred percent right. Because I mean, music comes the savage beast. Um, there's so many things that we could say, but I think that's why the young musician and, and you know, as a, you, you must have experienced this at some point in your life growing as a young player where you're like, you're working on all these things, chords, scales, modal stuff, solo ideas, heads for tunes, melodies, whatever it might be. And then I, I remember once I had this uncle of mine, we were at like an anniversary party and there's a violinist playing. And, he, and he's like, do you hear that? And it was just a violin. And, and he was like, that's like somebody, he's like seeing through his instrument. And not like he was trying to put me down because, you know, he would hang around, he would listen to me play or whatever. He goes, you need to listen to yourself. You're, you have all these tools and you're playing with all these tools, but use those tools and listen to yourself so you can allow yourself to come through your instrument and forget about the tools that you need to use. And all of a sudden, what you're talking about is that sense of divinity. It's that it's when you get those shivers that run up your back when you hear somebody do something or see them in those moments. Keith Jarrett, the keyboardist, American compositional jazz improvisationalist, uh, I the Cone concerts, uh, anything that I've seen him do with uh, the Gary with Gary Peacock, uh, 
when you see Keith play, he's almost like in a state of ecstasy. And the things that he's experiencing and going through, through these meditative processes, even before these shows, allow him to have that state of grace. And yeah. you can feel it. It's, yeah. it. And he makes strange sounds. Like he's like, eh, eh, eh. sometimes you can, but it's, it's the release, the relinquishment of the self and now allowing all of that to flow through him so it becomes like divine in that regard. So mm -hmm. I, it, when it's true, and that's, that's kind of where you start feeling the difference between the full version of, let's say, methodical songwriting. And, and, it, and sometimes there's method, but at the same time, when we, when we release more of the method, new creativity, new creation, new ideas, which is really the law of the universe, starts to occur we're so as i said so conditioned to those boxes is it rock and roll is it jazz is it metal yeah. is it punk is it this well it's music mingus charles mingus would say you know when he goes to europe when he would play they'd call him an american artist they wouldn't say he was a jazz musician he was defined by american culture mm -hmm. as a jazz compositional bass player i mean he's one of the greatest composers of the 20th century as far as i'm concerned but, you know, it's like <laughs> the, the definition sometimes is our downfall because we don't mm. allow for growth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Cross pollination. <laughs> oh, man, I hate when they try to try, try to box you in. And I find that with religion and mysticism and things a lot. They want to say, what are you? OK, you're this or whatever the case is. But what's what's cool with with the music thing is when you see those people up there, man, and they have the instruments or or they're singing they they almost like create a vortex they go to another place i mean there's tons of videos of of tons of people doing it and they and that's what i love to see that that person is not really there on stage they, they you know they, their eyes may be closed the whole time but they like create this vortex and if you can get with the rhythm you can go into that vortex with them i mean there's so many people their eyes are closed they're playing the drums or the djembe and they're they're zoned out. They're they're not even there anymore. We talk about Jimi Hendrix. Uh, just look at um. Th there's this performance, and I'm sure you've seen it. It's a uh, Santana. I think it was for Woodstock. Went out oh. and and or Lollapalooza one went out and uh, did LSD because they thought they were gonna play hours later, but That's they dropped right. acid and they said, "Time's up. You guys got to go on stage." And they're like, "What? We just dropped a bunch of acid and they're out there." just throwing down creating music they're they're got the look on on their faces and stuff there, there's video footage of it but it's insane that they, they're not there but they're communicating with the guitars and, and, and with the music and everybody there's on that i mean what is his name joe uh, crocker or cocker um seeing yep. him do it uh so many people man um and, and you know what sometimes you don't even have to see it i mean our records uh, i I mean, just as you're talking, I'm seeing the purple in the background. Uh, 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 King Curtis live at the Fillmore. It's got like, oh man, the lineup of people that is, is on it is just ridiculous. Regardless, they're doing this track and it gets the ballad of Big Joe or, or something like that. And at, at about three minutes and 41 seconds into the tune, I swear there's only four, There's the band is just rocking for the whole tune, but those four bars, the band turns purple. Wow. They go purple. They're just, you can feel this energy come off the record. And I'm even yeah. getting shivers and hairs coming up right now on my arm, <laughs> even thinking about it. And yeah. I'm not even listening to yeah. it. You know what I'm saying? So it reconjures even after the fact because the potency is still left in the heart, the spirit, the mind, and the body, even just by recollecting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, when we look at some of the beautiful stuff that's created through, through music, there, there's a lot of Christian groups out there now that are that are um um doing really good i think one is called uh you have well you have hillsong music and you have bethel music and they do that they create this place of worship right while they're on stage and they they're zoned out they're doing what their eyes are closed and they're opening up their spirit and singing to the creator not singing it this is the thing too with worship music and, and stuff or or just songs we talk about telling a story that's one thing but when someone's telling their story through the music or whatever the case is they that that when, when they create those lyrics they connect with it um so singing about god is one thing or singing about 
a boy named Goo, or whatever the case is. You're singing about somebody versus doing these songs that are about you in the place of your desperation, singing about God versus singing to God and connecting. So there's something there with some of the, uh, we see it on, I guess, on the Christian worship side. And then I would look at some of the darker stuff, the darker theme stuff, maybe like early Bone Thugs and Harmony stuff where they were you know, supposedly getting lyrics from the Ouija board and they had all the 666 and backward masking and, and the devil talking and just crazy stuff going on, talking about murder. What what could be used for light or something of beauty can also be used on the other end as well and to, to carry out an agenda. I mean, when you look into the music industry, whether it's just uh, stuff on the internet created that's made up, but there's a lot of videos and things out there about the music industry being tapped into dark forces and dark powers to to gain power and to make packs with the devil or with, I mean that's the big the big thing in rock and roll selling your soul to the devil to get fortune and fame. I mean that's the that's uh, that part of the theme there. Um, so just as much as something can be used for good energetically, spiritually, it could be used for bad as well. Um, some of it may be even theatrics. I actually had Busy Bone from Bone Thugs on my show. And uh, he didn't. He he played dumb. I tried to I tried to you know get butter from the duck, and uh, he played dumb the whole time. And no, nah, that was just a part. The Ouija board. Oh, that's a Parker's brother game. Oh, we didn't. That was just for looks. It's like you sure fooled a lot of people. If so, but honestly, on that tip, I think he was trying to clean up his image at the time. People were saying he's crazy and he's into a lot of mysticism and stuff. But I think he was trying to clean up his image, but. As far as the the dark themes, man, do you have any stories that have you messed with anything or been in a certain realm where you knew something was was funny with 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 dark themes? Well, you know, you have a feeling sometimes uh, in situations with people, circumstances, business dealings, um, yeah. and you know so- something isn't right. Uh, in a greater part of your statement, it's really interesting to 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 hear about the the dark and the light side of it and how you how you choose to wield it because i think whether you know like you said he was it's a parker brothers game i mean when you also project an image and at the end there are others that sort of latch onto that imagery because they're things that they're feeling it sort of manifests that sort of cloud or doorway or even building momentum of negative energy that could be societal yeah. I mean, uh, you could look back in time and I mean, when Mozart wrote The Marriage of Figaro, they didn't want to put it out because it had to deal with marriages and different classes and they didn't want to have any upheaval and what was going on in different things. Like So, uh, again, it, it, you know, it sounds crazy, but it's like I think a Star Wars sometimes and the analogy of the force between the good side and the bad side of our our duality that we our choices that we that we have. Some and, 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 and as the, as the, as those movies and sometimes the librettos of those things talk point out, it's like, you know, um, it becomes that choice. What side do you feed? There's an old Aboriginal thing in my studio that I keep on the wall, and there's a picture of a black wolf and a white wolf, and the story that the Aboriginal he goes to his grandfather and says, "Why is there good and evil in the world?" And he and the and the grandfather says, "Because in your heart there are two wolves: a dark wolf and a light." wolf. And the young boy says, well, well, who wins? And he says, well, it all depends on which one you feed. Mm-hmm. And, and I think music, because that a- appeal of the negative and news media loves to wield the negative continually, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it sells records. Yeah, uh, People have made up the, the catastrophe about Paul McCartney being killed in a car accident. Yeah. And that's who Bill DeShear was. That's catastrophe selling records. Uh, and people capitalize off of those kinds of things. But I think that what you're talking about, what we're talking about, about the spirituality or the truth behind stuff, which is finding that that bigger message that's bigger than you. It, it's it's almost hard to explain. It's like all this stuff is coming at us every day from the things that we read, the things that we see, the people that we talk to, where we go. And all of a sudden, this amalgam and concept of idea pops out and you go, Okay, I'm either angry about this and it's okay to follow the path of anger because in the end it may show you something greater about the positive and vice versa. Some of the positivity may point out certain things that are like, well, but this in the end could make you angry 
you know, because <laughs> you're missing all this positivity. Yeah. There's so many different aspects to the duality of it. But yeah. in, in my, to answer your question, to finalize it, you know, I've met some people where I just walk into their office right away because there's going to be a business dealing going on. And, and, and I in the room has this darkness in it. It's not yeah. that there aren't lights on and there isn't a window in the room, but you can tell right away that there's something else. Like shady. This other person is, has, yeah. You know, shady. Yeah. And, 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 and I just, I, I've, I've learned to kind of go, I'm going to keep an arm's length from all this stuff because I, that's not what it's about for me. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's about trying to find uh, some sort of personal experience in the greater part of life experience in, in the now. You know, and, and it's not just my experience. It's it's like people that I talk to and, and, and stories I hear, stuff I hear in social media. But I, I tend to, to shy away, and, and I do wholeheartedly, from any of that real negativity, other than the fact that I think that sometimes the, 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 the anger can be wielded correctly in a way that, that it, it is, it's more poignant than being like, you know, go out and kill a bunch of people. Yeah, um, there's a bunch of uh, all those videos and stuff that talk about the the devil and the music industry and rock and roll. A bunch of them use a clip from uh, Bob Dylan who talks about, you know, he was coming for his due. The devil was always coming and, you know, you sold your soul for rock and roll, that type of deal. Um, just like you said, there's many aspects of it. I always I also think that there's a symbolic aspect of it as well. Like symbolic that, look, uh, I traveled the world. I slept around. I did this. I had everything on a silver platter. I, I, the devil petitioned me to sell my soul for rock and roll symbolically, uh, meaning that I gave up something. Like I gave up time with my kids. I wasn't there for my kids, but I enjoyed the sweet things in life. And we, we hear that all throughout music and stuff as well. So like you said, I think there's some, some piece of that that's symbolic too. And the fact that um, we're just obsessed with, horror we're obsessed with the negative stuff on the news i mean I, I think we all reach a point to like man why can't we watch the news and hear about the good stuff going on in our communities and so and so you know help who is helping children or starting fundraisers let's hear about let's let's do a whole two hour segment on these type of of stories but it, like i said people wouldn't watch it uh tool has a song called vicarious and it talks about like we need to see things die. We want, we're like thrilled by watching the horror or the demonic things or whatever the case is. And we love the horror movies. We love it in our music. We love to see people sell their souls to the devil as long as it isn't us. As long as we can watch it from a, a, <laughs> a good safe distance, as the song says, we, we see it happening to somebody else, like watching The Walking Dead. Like, I, I absolutely love that show. You know, we, we love seeing that stuff. But as long as it's happening to somebody else, it's okay. But there's something deep within the hearts of men where we and we love it, man. And if it was the good stuff, it wouldn't get it. It, it doesn't get airplay because there's good stuff happening throughout the, uh, you know, every city, every community has good stuff happening, but they don't cover it or they barely cover it or whatever the case is. Well, you're right. I mean, sorrow sells. And, and, and you know there can be no true beauty without decay. Mm -hmm. That this is the this That's is true. the aspect of life that everything dies in order for us to live. We die. We we you know have children. They get older. They die. They have children. It's a it's a constant. But the imprinting that we left, the, the things that even nature still imprints on us, that to me also like you know is a part of. Uh, the sort of the dark and light aspect of, of our choices and stuff like that. Like you say, well, yeah, it, it, in your previous statement, you were saying it becomes like, um, you know, like, well, you know, I lived the good life and I did these things, but I, 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 you know, I didn't spend time with my children. I didn't spend time with my life. Or why, why my wife, I screwed around on my wife. I, yeah. all, all those things again, become a part of, 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 of that thing was like, well, you know, how do we choose to absorb it? How do we choose to, to use it in our lives. And, you know, it, it, yes, we have a morbid fascination with everything, but again, that that's the thing about spirituality on the other side of the fence that it's trying to tell us that this is a constant and, and death is a part of life. Um, but, you know, the fascination and how we amplify it 
in the Hollywood sense of things mm -hmm. tends to really, you know, people can't help but not look. And, and what, I mean, you're driving down the highway and there's an accident. You yeah. want to keep going. You want to try to keep the speed. But, you know, at some point you're going to go, holy cow, what just happened? <laughs> yeah. You know, you're trying you to get keep a peak. Going. Yeah. You got to get a peak, right? You got to mm -hmm. get a peak. And even when you hurt yourself, you know, eventually the cut's bad. You got your hand on it. You're bleeding. And you know you're going to go, oh, man, you know, like it's bad. You got to look at it, right? Um, I think that's also a part of recognition and realizing too, as to, you know, what's kind of really going on the news media, like I, I tend not to watch TV anymore. It's so filtered with, you know, like I said, so much negativity and anxiety and man, I'd rather be out either if I had free time in my garden or out in the bush, you know, or with my guitar or doing something that's a little bit more creative, but Oh, yeah. I, 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 get, I get off on that as opposed to like, because I grew up in 70s culture and 80s culture when television was making an explosion and the whole family would get around the TV and it would be like an event, <laughs> Yeah, you know, and you'd watch like All in the Family and Sanford and Son and Grandma and Granddad would love watch Lawrence Welk on Sunday afternoons and things like that. And now it's become where everybody has access to television, video. There are people that are living in their own homes. They hardly talk to one another. There's Wi-Fi everywhere. Yeah. All of those kinds of things are inundating us with that ability, less ability to be tactically related to our environment. So we're actually doing things with our hands and seeing the byproduct of what that is. Sometimes people think, well, that's trivial because that's, you know, passe. That's in the past. Nobody wants to do those things anymore. Look at this app. And at the same time, we're losing something as a part yeah. of that in terms of communication and, and, and stuff like that. So, I, you know, news media, I, I go in and I check it. I go, uh, the amplitude, where is it at? What are they talking about? And how are they shoveling it to us? Yeah. You get the classic. I, I don't see a lot of good journalism mm -hmm. going on on television. You get the two spin doctors or three people. Here's all your opinions. You come from all these different backgrounds. And at the end of the two hour show, you're left feeling confused and unsure yet. For a you know reason, I, mean? I think, man. Well, that's just it. I think that they're, the, the idea that the news stations, even in the United States, are really owned by a couple of people, Yeah. you know, it, it, it goes to show you that it's easy to disseminate information that you want and create, a uh, let's say, a black and white or red and blue or however you want to slice it version of, we think this, you're wrong. We think this, you're wrong. We think this, you're wrong. And where do we come together? to build something new where everybody feels prosperous is about always pointing out to us what is wrong with why we communicate <laughs> with why we, this religion did this and this religion yeah. did that. And that, that race group did this and that race group did that. We're all people, man, every spiritual leader that we decide to follow, whether it be Jesus Christ or Muhammad or anybody, they're all saying the same thing. But here we are toting their flag saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. But we're people. You know what I mean? So the, I, I tend to, you know, even Hollywood has that effect where, you know, the ideas that are, that are that are in the librettos of the stories and stuff, people go, well, you know, this court case is based on this murder and the situation. And what happened? What was just like in the movie? Da, 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 da. So, you know, again, information being put out was like just a movie. But at the same time, you know, how many of those movies come with warnings? Yeah. You know, uh, television shows come with warnings. Uh, you know, we could go on and on about, yeah, you know. It, yeah, there's many aspects on it. And just to kind of kind of touch a little bit about being disconnected. Like I've seen children. <laughs> I've seen mm -hmm. children playing like... Uh, the Nintendo Wii or the N Nintendo Switch, and there was a thing that came out these these animal games, and so there's these games where you have a virtual pet on your screen, and you can throw the ball for your pet on the television, and you actually have the ball and you throw it with the hand motions and stuff. You pet your dog, you water him, you feed him, you play with him, spend time with him. I've seen children play that with their dog sitting in the back watching them, like. You're playing with this fake virtual dog, but you could be playing with your real dog, but you would rather get into the technology and play with the, the virtual dog. It's the irony there. It's like, come play with this dog. He'll fetch. Like, it's how are you going to play that game and then go, right? yeah, and then go get on another console or iPad but or whatever are, the case But is. are you going to be able to get in your bed on a Sunday morning when the rain is hitting the roof with your dog? And he's snuggling up to you or she's snuggling up to you. And you're looking at each other going, geez, man, I'm, I'm thankful that we're together and that we're living our lives. 
and that we're friends. You know, all of those kind. Of, I don't get from an app. It's so clinical, and it, it it's this dis, d- detachment from so many of the empathetic aspects of human feeling yeah. that is the most dangerous part of it. Because, you know, if people don't have empathy for something that's going on, and you're pulling out your camera while somebody's bleeding on the ground, being beaten up, and you're, and you're filming it. Watched the video uh, like that this morning, yeah. Like, what the heck? You know, like... Watched the video like that this morning. Um... That's that's the disconnect there. Um, I used to get mad at it, like when it when when I was becoming more spiritual and more conscious of this stuff going on, understanding Kali Yuga and with this 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 prophecy of that man would use machines to fight against God. I think we're in that time, you know. Um, we're fighting against nature, destroying nature. You know, there's, you know, you'd rather watch a video about nature than actually walking out and getting in nature, like those type of. It's going on. And we look at Facebook. We look at this stuff that's supposedly making us connected. And there's this notion of the global brain, right? Is that we're already connected spiritually. We're already connected. Like when we, when you talk about going in that room and you feel that heaviness or that I shouldn't be here or something, somebody's doing something they shouldn't be doing. And you walk, you can walk in a room and feel that we're all connected. We're, we're, we're all able to sense what other people are going through. Facebook kind of, takes this sense of us being connected and they put it into a technological format and they mimic what's already there for spirituality. And that's what we see a lot of technology doing, just mimicking what we already have or what we're already capable of doing. So I got, I was like, I would speak against it and get mad and stuff early on, but it's like, we we can't, we can't, I don't think we can fight against it. I think this is where we're, we're headed. I think we could try to utilize it to do podcasts, to bring people together to use what is becoming so addictive and is tearing families apart and things like that. Um, use it to try to bring some good into the world versus just letting uh, it, it do what it is going to do regardless. I mean, pe- there's people giving up their phones and, you know, they only want to use flip phones because they're so addicted to their phones. And we've all been there, but I, there is etiquette with all of this stuff. We can use it for our good. I mean, even a lot of the, the te- technology when it comes down to, to making music as well. I mean, that's technology as well. It just depends on how advanced we want to become with it and, and how much of it we're going to let consume us with our social life. And so that was a big thing. Facebook being social media, you can log into your account. And see all of your friends' birthday party pictures, what they did this weekend, what they did last week. And it, it nullifies this fact that you have to check in with them and say, hey, man, uh, or even show up to the party. You kind of feel like you went because you've seen everybody who was there. You read the comments. You know what presents they got. So in in you, the this, this social need to, to connect with people socially, it's it, it, it kind of fills that void through social media. And you won't even have to talk to these people for months or years and you you run into them, but they've been keeping up with you. But you don't know that. Like, I haven't heard from you in, in months or even years. And they're like, hey, I seen, seen you went to Disney World this weekend. It's like, oh, okay. You know what I'm saying? So they, they, they're keeping up with you. Um, so going out, getting a beer, going have dinner, lunch with people, like, it pushes the notion like I have to get out of the house. Many of us are turning into hermits. Like e- even in, in my, my, my cave here, I've got everything, you know, socially. I, cr- I can create music. I create podcasts. I play video games. Everything. I, and it's, so I have to make myself be sociable. Like, you know, I need to go hang out with some friends. I need to go out to eat and get on my phone and call all these people and let's meet up. Let's hang out so that I don't become that person. Like I see it happening. So I don't want to become that, you know? Yeah, well, you know what? And you're, you're very prolific, my friend, because never before, I think, has a tool, a technological tool. A washing machine many years ago could have been considered a technological <laughs> tool. <laughs> you know, we had a telephone or rotary phone. We didn't know who was ringing when the phone rang. We just picked it up. It could have been a neighbor. It could have been an uncle. It could have been somebody selling light bulbs. But ultimately, it, we didn't go to sleep with them. We didn't carry them everywhere. If somebody had a phone in their car, yeah. they were like a diplomat or a dignitary or something like that. And that's why they had to have that. Now when a four-year-old or a five-year-old is, you know, doing what they're doing on a phone, 
I'm like, hmm, that's a little too soon as far as like an immense amount of technological information yeah. instantaneously being handed into a young person's hand without them developing any sort of like creative or tactical abilities without it. Because having the brain develop that way without it being immediately for is so much information at once you can't focus. This is why ADD and other things like that are also on the rise because te kids' attention span yeah. are, are, are so short. What is it? Like the average adult is seven seconds. Yeah. You know, so again, it, I think it's how we use it. You know, I, I know many carpenters that have saws, hammers, drills, whatever it is, but they don't go to sleep with them. They don't drive in the front car with them. They're not always checking them when they're out to dinner. They're not like, you know. <laughs> so, again, it becomes yeah. a matter of choice. I, I, I was there, too. Like I me, mean, for years, I resisted social media as a result of the exact same sympathetic feelings we have. Then I went, wait a minute. I can't communicate with people in the old fashioned yeah. way yeah. by calling or doing whatever. Telegram. <laughs> it's yeah, instantaneously people are getting back to me. I'm like, this is great. And before yeah. I know it, I'm spending eight hours a day doing what I'm doing. And then I went, wait a minute, like you, I gotta cut the digital umbilical cord and mm -hmm. and do other things. Not like I don't, but I can see, like you said, the deluge of how it can take over. Yeah, it literally does. And 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 and, and again, it's I, I don't think it's healthy. <laughs> well, you see people on, on, on Facebook and social media and we've probably all done it, but they, they do their status. Hey, guys, stepping away from social media. I have to get back and on my studies. I have, I'm, too, I'm too consumed with this media. I'm stepping away. I'm, de I'm deleting my account. I'm gone. I had fun. If anybody needs me, you have my number. And it's like it's 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 comical now because you know that they're going to feel disconnected. Like we want to feel disconnected. We want to feel like we're in the loop and they may step away for any period of time, a day, a week, a month, whatever. But they always come back because that feeling is going to hit you because it's the truth. Now you're not connected anymore. You like, you don't, you don't know. Like it's so much easier to, to send somebody an instant message or to do a party invite or whatever the case is. It's just how it's just what we're becoming, man. Um, but to see right. those people step away, it's comical because I've done it. I mean, I've said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to take a week off of Facebook. I feel disconnected. Man, what is going on without me? Something's <laughs> happening without me. You feel that way, man. Everybody feels that. And so it's it's it can be an addiction and you have to get uh, – a hold of it, just like anything could be an addiction. This coffee we're drinking, the you know, listening to music, whatever, any anything could be an addiction if it's overboard. And social media is is definitely uh, something that a lot of people are addicted to. So there's etiquette that we got to learn, and there's this, um, you know, time management, man, for real. Well, you know, this Facebook, you, you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave, right? <laughs> It's exactly. I mean, that's why a lot of people think that this is the mark of the beast and that the Internet and technology is the plan of the enemy. Everybody's waiting for the RFID chip and they're just itching well, for this to be implemented to everyone. And Well, you know. here's the other thing, too, on a frequency level. It's just like, OK, we all have electric light. Thank you, Nikola Tesla. Um, and as a result, you know, they work on a on a sort of frequency. 60 hertz frequency. And in fact, before they figured out that they needed to speed up the frequency, it worked at 30 hertz, which meant the actual light bulbs would flicker. And at 60 hertz, they're extremely stable. So they look like a constant light as opposed to this 60 cycle frequency that's happening. LED lights work at such a high frequency that they even send uh, EV meters right off of their scale sometimes because of the frequencies that are cutting off of it. Now, I had a gentleman, and, and I'll say his name because, you know, he's a reputable person. is Bob McConnell from Tesla Magazine. And he had contacted me through a friend. He wanted to do some tests up here at my studio because I live way up in the country and I don't have a lot of Wi-Fi or RF or anything like that. And he did this thing with me where it's like, okay, he started checking my normal bulbs and showing me on his meter how low the frequency was. And then he showed me an LED bulb. And I said, okay, so why is this so significant? Why do I need to be worried about this, Bob? And he said, well, come upstairs to the studio where we're doing these experiments. He had an LED screen of about 40 LED lights, and he plugged it into his phone. And he held it up, and, the, and the, the board lit up right away. And he said, now stare into these lights and just tell me what song you hear. And I'm like, what? 
And he's like, no, no. I, he said, stare into these lights and tell me what song you hear. And I'm like, okay. And I'm like, so I'm, I'm there. I'm staring and staring. And it, like arbitrarily, you would have a tune come into your head or a thought or somebody was phrased or somebody said something to you. I had Simon and Garfunkel like, like a bridge over trouble. I said, like a bridge over troubled waters. He pulls the pin out and out of the phone is playing bridge over troubled waters in that spot that I was hearing it in my head. Hmm. And he Subliminally, said, almost. So you can project yeah. dual and triple and quadruple and multi levels of information through LED signals. And at the same time, he said, the kicker is is that the cerebral cortex, when it's receiving this information in your pineal gland, which is also a, a sort of an ocular receptor, because it's actually like an eye, it has rods and cones, it's in the center of your brain, this is what the third eye in the human individual is supposed to be, it can actually project images into the LED system that can be read. And, and you're saying, well, you know, ultimately omnipotence when one or two people or a group of people have control of the thought patterns yeah. and every nuance of everything that's going on, you do have an apocalyptic kind of moment yeah. because we're no longer free of our thinking. And, and we're for addicted to the very system that they say keeps us in communication. How do we stay away from it other than by choice? It has to be through reckoning and realization that that all happens. It's like an epiphany in itself. Yeah, and, the, and 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 they'll do it to you too. If you don't go on for a week and a half, you know, you do your quick posts in the morning, check a few things, make sure whatever. But then you don't go off for but so and so posted on their page. Da, 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 da. They're trying to pull you about. Well, did I miss something? I know so and so. Maybe I should check out what's going on. No, they're just trying to reel you back in, and then you flip through a bunch of things. Your goat goes through the roof. You start arguing with somebody. Then you're on there for five or ten minutes. You're all of a sudden, you know, it's like it's so perfect. And now, yeah. now here's the thing, you know, the big computer that's down uh, in the U.S. What is it called again? In uh, where? Excuse me, help me. The Mormon state. Okay. Uh, there's some um, Utah. Where is this? Utah. Thank you. It's called the Beast. Yeah. That Google owns, and yeah, it is beast, yeah. and now a, a Yoda byte is what is it? Two hundred million gigs. I'm not sure. So this co this computer is like over two eight hundred million Yoda bytes. It's computing and taking in information, continuing scrutinizing through different things and looking for keychain phrases. And it has all sorts of different stuff that it's always checking out. Yeah. So, so to me, you're kind of right. I mean, what did, <laughs> what did John of Patmos say? It'll be in the head or the hand. Yeah. You see, most of the people, <laughs> most of the time, they're just sitting there with their head in their hand. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it could be, man. I think it's all, I think, I think revelation is, uh, relative to wh wherever you are you know what i'm saying T to them it was experiencing then and uh whether history repeats itself or we just uh we want to be the people of the book or the people at the end time you know those type of things um but he here's a kicker too when, when it comes to this light and right these tv screens are just blinking lights really fast you're talking about the the uh the um the hertz that it's 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 sending the signal at that's why when you see an older television or computer screen on camera with another tv the frame rate is slower so you're able to see these lines and see it f flickering something you can't see because you're not able to, to, to process it that fast with with your um um naked eye but there was something in the early televisions, the early television when televisions were made, there's a tube in there and it's called the cathode ray tube. And so this was used in ancient culture in ancient Egypt. There's pictures of it to communicate with the spirit realm. So they would shine light through one end of this little tube and it would project an image on the wall. And, and the image, as they were contacting entities, the, the entities would uh, move the light particles around and communicate with them through like uh, putting images of the entity on the wall and communicating and stuff. And that same tube, the cathode ray two tube was in the early televisions that were created. That's right. And there's even, if you look it up, it's called the sound of silence irony, as we were saying it before technology that was patented in the 1970s that had the ability to send dual and triple signals, even though you're watching an audio and video signal coming through a coaxial cable, you could still send other signals through that signal through the cathode yeah. tube, just like you're talking about. 
you know, uh, Daniel Estulin, who is a big follower of the Bilderberg Group and has written a number of books, says the greatest hypnotist that we all have in this world is the television. And we all have one in our homes. I've seen it like even with like hip, hip hop culture and stuff. They'll take I've seen trends overnight. A big name rapper will do something off the wall. And then the next day, as you go out into the into the culture, everybody starts doing it. And I seen when, and this is just little things. I remember when Lil Wayne, the famous rapper, got dreadlocks. Everybody got dreadlocks right after that. Every now, every dude you see has dreadlocks. Um, there's a rapper named Ti. He come out with this. It's been years into early two thousands, but he wore his hat on side of his head, not on his head, not backward, but on the actual side of his head. And then the next day you got into the culture, everybody, and they put it because they put it on TV in a music video. And then the next day, everybody's wearing their hats the same type of way. It's really weird how much power that thing has. Well, it's subliminal imagery, which is also, too, hard to detect. I mean, in the 70s, when they would do it at movies and in the late 60s, you'd have one frame inside of that film that would have a picture of a coca-cola like a soft drink let's say and a pop pop bag of popcorn and all of a sudden yeah. during intermission you'd be like yeah let's get some popcorn and, uh, <laughs> and a soft drink uh yep. and, and and it's also suggested the language the way that it's wielded in some ways it, even in basic things like in commercials i hate this where it's like yeah. Are you tired of chopping? Oh, it's such a mess. Da 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 da. It's so cumbersome. They're telling <laughs> you that you are feeling this Suggestion. way. And this is why you need Bobo's Super Chopper. You know, and it's just another piece of junk. restless leg syndrome. Are your legs tired? Yeah, yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah, you know, like they and they are, aren't they? You know, you've had a hard day. You've been da 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 da. da. So why tr cooking is drudgery? Why not just put this frozen piece of junk filled with salt and sugar in the oven for your family? You yeah. know, all of those guys. They're not going to. And 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 to capitalize off of that, when I, I love the Terry Gilliam film, uh, How to Get Ahead in Advertising, and at the beginning of the film. You know, he's going into this whole thing about, you know, selling stuff to the public. Like, oh, I know wh what she's like. She uses so many rolls of toilet paper and da 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 da. And he goes through this whole list and he goes, no matter how bad it is, we're going to sell it to them because it's 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 capitalism. It's it's, it's it, and I'm not saying capitalism is a bad thing to capitalize off of an idea in a good and positive way where people yeah. are going to benefit from it is one thing. But just to sell for the sake of selling because you want to make money and make a providing profit. substandard yeah. things. Yeah. How many times have you gone and you bought something and you're like, I just paid 40 bucks for this and it's broken because <laughs> it's plastic. That's because the consumer species goes, okay, we'll take anything you shovel us because we won't complain enough and say we won't participate in buying that and keep making plastic junk that we don't need. It, you know, It's and buyer's it's like, remorse, man. Yeah, I'm walking through even, the mall and I see a hat or a shirt and I want it and there's it's calling to me. Like I buy it and I'm like, why did I spend this money? I don't even I'm probably not even gonna wear this. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, I know. And and you know what? It even becomes it, more con consequential when it becomes food. Mm -hmm. And like to me, that's as, as important as education, you know, and free thinking as anything because if we don't have a choice to know where and how our food is produced, we're being fed substandard food. I know I've been gardening and farming my whole life as well. I come from a big family of farmers and I've seen such a change in agricultural practices in the last 40 years. I'm almost staggered by it in the fact that so much localized food is being exported. And at the same time, we're bringing in food from further away that costs actually a little bit less money, but it's substandard. We don't know who grew it, what was sprayed on it, if it's genetically modified, all of these kinds of things that on a biological level yeah. create a healthy body and a healthy mind. Yeah. Those choices then that you get to make, I get to put this in my body because I know it's good for me. I grew that. My friend grew that. I got it at a farmer's market and I know Jim and I know his wife and da, 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 da. And this supports his family, he puts his kids through school. It yep. does all these kinds of things. The experience of consumption completely changes. It's not just the arbitrary feeding trough aspect. And if we don't have that label that says yep. Jim and his wife produced it, how do we vote with our dollar? It's like the same thing. You're walking through the mall and you go, well, I really want that. But then it's like, well, who am I supporting? 
inside of this mechanism. And it's so enticing. Again, it's like, I want, they're, they're placating that aspect, but at the same time, it's not, there's nothing with, what am I, you said, what am I going to do with it? It's probably going to sit on the bench. I might wear it a bunch of times. And then what am I going to do with it? Yeah. Well, it's the fact that how did you come home with it? You know what I'm saying? Like I said, we're talking about the colors, the, the font, the wording. I mean, I'm even looking at that with YouTube videos. Like we can just have a picture of me and you and have a compelling title. That's one thing, but it's something about having this bright font, this bright text. Those those thumbnails always catch catch my attention. It's like it's for a reason. Like they, they have the font on there really big. So it's like there's little small ways and it's being done for for harm, it's being done for evil, but our job is to try to do it for good, especially if we're if we have some spiritual understanding of light and darkness and things like that and especially if we have something positive or powerful to share with the people. I mean, we're just talking about like uh, dark sayings in the music. Or we we talked about before we went live backward masking and stuff like that going on in, in music. Um, there is this this notion that um, chanting and spells and things are being done within the music and, uh, and, and, and turned down in a lot of famous songs that are being spoken over you because the frequency is still there. If we want to learn anything, we have to, have to learn it in the terms of vibration and movement. Frequency, your voice carries a carries a tone carries a pitch carries a frequency and it's in the music so i i've learned all this stuff i've studied the illuminati stuff i've watched hours and hours and hours of videos and I say you know what if this is working and this is what they're doing let me try to do it on the other side let me speak blessings in my music and turn it down let me pray over people let me speak that they're going to have a great day let me speak over this song that they're going to encounter the divine and have blessings in their life and i've been doing that we get done with a song we'll go in there and we'll pray or we'll do chants over it or, or whatever and i'll turn it all the way down and it's crazy that people are having like spiritual encounters listening to my music and it's happening it's, it, it is working We'll turn it all the way down so you can't hear it, but you can feel it. When you're That's listening, right. you're like, dude, I'm, I'm, I was like, I'm listening to your music, True Seeker, and I'm crying listening to a rap song. Like, what's going on here, right? It's working, man. So we, I'm studying that and seeing what they're doing, but I'm doing it for the, the good reasons. But that's amazing. And that and that that just goes to show you that the thing that you're encapsulating in that recording the frequency of the positivity that you're trying to wield is translating, even though it's not in your face. Yeah. It's still uh, there. And you were talking about color and stuff before too. It's like, even from a very young age, we're conditioned. Nature conditions us. Yeah. Uh, red is a prime example. When you're a little boy, you know, you see the kid, he's got the red fire truck or whatever frequency it's so cool it's coming down the street the lights are red na, 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 na. tritone everybody out of the way all of a sudden when that long, young boy gets to that next age group you have soft drinks that are brightly colored with red you have all kinds of candies and red packaging <laughs> colored Colorful. with red yeah then they go to the next stage all the fast foods brightly colored with reds and yellows and those kinds of things high frequency Again, little Susie that comes through that same thing is inundated with pink and fuchsias and all these other sort of really psychosexual colors. You know, Barbie's filled with it and Disney films are always filled with it. And they're being even conditioned on that frequency level to keep gravitating to those kinds of things. So it's like even cosmetics have those colors in it. And, and, and it's, it's all part of that same early, this is my choice, but it's not. Because I don't even know that I'm reacting to these frequencies in nature. You and I go out to the bush and we're hunting or, or hiking or doing whatever we're doing. And I say, hey, man, don't eat that berry because it's red. It's poisonous. Stay mm -hmm. away from it. That frequency in the bug, same thing with bugs, snakes, other things that are colored, those bright colors of vibrancy symbol and symbol to, the, to our eye, our cerebral cortex, again, going stay away. And at the same time, they're the very things that we go, yes, it's good to eat because it is red. It's an apple, it's a strawberry, it's a raspberry, it's a tomato, all of those kinds of things. And even in the past, the tomato <laughs> was considered to be the devil's fruit. They didn't know what it was. And I can't remember what state it was in the U.S. Gentleman brought him up from South America. He had to eat him in front of the townspeople on his porch to prove that he wasn't going to die because red could have been a symbol wow. frequency for poison. Yeah. So again, you know, you're right. Those, those frequencies, if we project them, 
and I'm getting a bit in this in these conversations because I love talking to you too. You feel like there's this amalgaming of good positive energy that mm-hmm. just is like a Taurus motor that just starts to, to feed up into everything. And I agree with it. You project a negativity, and whether you're messing around with it or not, that's like saying, Well, we were just messing around with the Ouija board, and now we've got this third class leather back vapor demon in our home. We were just playing around. Uh, well, wait a minute. What else is going on here? There's got to be something else to the intent behind what we're doing. Yeah, Buddhist the, monks have done these experiments where they've prayed mm-hmm. on water and as it's been freezing and they've seen their their actual change in the way yeah. that they look the pace on their energy. You know, Molecular like structures changing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they, I mean, that's been, man, the whole um, power of sound, of music, of vibration. And it all gets into the spiritual aspect of it is the fact that you can change the genetic makeup of, of water you can speak to it and say blessings over it i know that they had the uh dr emoto's rice experiment we actually did that my fan i did it with my wife and daughter and i uh, just to see if it was real because i mean i've studied the ancient text i've studied the bible i know all of these sayings about how powerful your words are and life and death are in the power of the tongue and it has the ability to bless and curse by you speaking and, and how powerful words are. I was like, I watched that. We want it to be true, but I tried it and 100% it worked. It worked. We had one uh, vial of, of rice. I actually shared the, the picture the other day. I, I did a video on it, but I lost my channel and lost that video. But I have the picture. One vial of rice we spoke blessings over. I love you. You're awesome. You're going to be a you're going to bless somebody good things are going to come from you and you know i love you all of these blessings on the other one and the other one we spoke curses over i hate you you're stupid you'll never amount to nothing why are you even here i don't even (laughs) like you and we we literally did that and the weird thing of i guess being spiritual or knowing that these words have power i eventually felt bad for even cursing the one that i was speaking the uh curses over and speaking you know what i'm saying the uh um, the, but there's th- words, there's something man. to be said about your intent because words can be idle. Yeah. And if they're not, if there is nothing behind them, and this is why we have spiritual leaders, they have that ability to to amplify that, and and we then can gravitate to the understanding of what that amplification is. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> man. I mean, there, there, I think uh, there was a, I want to say it's a computer company or something, or Nokia or some 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 company. Uh, put out in schools they have a um, they put plants out and they did the same experiment with plants I mean plants are made up of water as well just like the human body so it's not the rice it's the water that that the rice was in as well uh, to be able to speak to that water and they're doing these experiments with other things and big companies are getting behind it and sure enough there was a plant that was dead and the other plant was alive and thriving with life and you can look up those videos that the life, life and death truly are in the power of the tongue that's true. Blue are the life-giving waters taken for granted. They quietly understand. James Marshall Hendricks. We're well, talking about uh, what we put in our bodies and, uh, you know, having this connection with it, whether it's the the, uh, the fast food or the stuff that we hunt. Um, I'm not a hunter. Um, I have a weak stomach. I see dead animals. It. I can't do it. I, I know what. I know how. I know the process. My wife comes from a family of hunters, though. She's been hunting since she was a little kid. And um, she would go out and hunt and she would kill a deer and we could eat on that one deer that she killed for like a year. Like me and my mm-hmm. family could eat. We'd never have to buy any meat or anything, whether it was deer tacos, deer steak, deer burgers, whatever. Like we ate on that for a year. That's that's one thing. You don't have to keep buying this meat over and over. But when she prepared it, even though I didn't kill it, she went out and killed it and brought it home and all of that stuff. There was a different connection partaking of that meat. There was a gratitude there. We know where we knew where the meat came from, all of this stuff. And it was a different spiritual connection that was there of knowing where your food came from versus you went out and just there's a disconnect. Hey, I have this burger. I don't know where the lettuce, the tomato, if it's even real, you know, the meat, how much of this meat is real, how much is horse meat. Even the Illuminati conspiracy stuff, how much is human meat? Like there's some weird theories out there about that. You don't, you have no, you don't know. You don't know. And so there's a different, there's a disconnect there. But with the hunter thing or even growing things in our backyard and and eating them, um, it's a different feeling, man. 
Oh, you're totally right. And it increases that appreciation level. It's a, it, 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 you realize that it's not just, see, that's life experience. Arbitrarily buying and coming home, it's nice. To provide for your family and have food and have something on the table is a blessing. But at the same time, sometimes th that take for granted mentality because it's become a norm, you lose exactly what you just said. Even if it's just something as simple as carrots or, or tomatoes in your backyard, it has that new relationship. It is, it does taste better it, because it's right from your backyard and it's fresh and it's still alive and it's providing to you. And at the same time, the work that you put in it, the care, the time is part of that religious experience. It's the nurturing of life to nurture you, to nurture life again the following season. I know hunters and I don't hunt myself. I fish, but I've never actually shot anything yeah. other than maybe a couple birds when I was a kid or something. I still have remorse about it. But <laughs> at the same time, uh, you know, that, that what you're talking about, they, they put down four animals as 16 people or 12 people all eat from those four or five animals for the whole year sausage, burgers, yeah. everything that you can possibly think of. And that when I've eaten with them, that sense of reverence yeah. is amplified there. Whether I was a part of that experience mm -hmm. in, in, in culling and killing the animal or not. And, and we've lost that, again, relationship to the death experience inside of that reality. When we, when we used to run our farm and, you know, we have kids come from a school and I'd be there milking cow by hand. We had milking systems and stuff like that. But we used to do it the old way to show them. And they're like, they didn't know where milk came from. Yeah, they didn't know that, that you <laughs> it comes know, from the store. To, yeah, it came from a store, man. You know, and that, that's what I guess I get off on and talking with people. It's like with music, it's it's it still has that same connection to creation and experiencing and sharing. You know, it, 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 that's something I've always struggled with. I've went back and forth with the uh, the vegetarian thing for a long time. I'm reading a comment here. Darth says, "I'd rather just eat plants. I don't like the notion of killing something that can still live a good." life ahead and that was uh, probably one of my biggest convictions was the fact that you're taking this animal away from its family just to, to eat or whatever the case is i have a, a, an inward struggle with that I, i've just done it for a couple months at a time and then ate a chicken nugget and then f went all the way back and i've always went back and forth with it for just uh you know two three months at a time and there's there's so much study there's so much research about the whole vegetarian diet um but of, of whether it being good or whether it being bad, it's debatable. The thing that helps me consciously, um, whether this is good or this is just an excuse, is really understanding the universe and that life consumes life. And so for us to exist, something has to die, uh, whether it's plants, whether it's bacteria, whatever the case is. And, 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 it it's just the law of the universe. I mean, even we talk. I reference Tool. They have a, a a lyric in the same song, Vicarious, that says that, uh, you know, pull your head out of your hippie haze. The universe is is hostile, so impersonal. Just as it was, so it will always be. Devour to survive. Something has to die. There's a lot of religious people listening. A lot of Christians, like Jesus, had to die for you to live. Like just so it was, so it will always be. Um. Whether it's plants and, and, and so the, the, the vegans and stuff are kind of like coming out saying, well, plants aren't alive and they can't feel. And all. I think it is, though. I think all That's of it, man. True. They're, yeah, they can feel because I've they're communicating been a part of all of that. Experiments, like yeah. the Baxter experiments have showed that plants definitely have electrical conductivity. They can communicate with one another. They can communicate with insects. They can feel fear. They can feel positivity. Um, I've seen it happen. It, it, so, but at the same time, here, you know what? I was a vegan for 20 years uh, and devout. Yeah. No leather belts, no leather shoes, nothing. Um, and then, you know what? It was for me, I had a bunch of blood tests done. And it wasn't that my blood was out of whack. I just never had known my blood type. What are and you? I found out my, I was like an O positive. And uh, I started reading this book that was called Eat for Your Blood Type. That's a big, that's and, a big thing. Yeah. And it was weird. I saw a documentary on the keyboardist Horace Silver, and he was a vegan. And he said he started feeling these mental fog moments and like body pangs of like there's yep. something missing. And, and, and he said, you know what? So what I did is I broke precedent. And about every six months, I go and have a steak. 
and it, he needed it. And for yeah. me, it's like I'm the same way. It's like it happened I to my wife. It seems you get it. You get it. You know what I'm talking about. So it, it, it was more me figuring out. But I don't eat a lot of beef. Yeah. I don't eat a lot of chicken. I eat a lot of fish. Yeah. Um, but you know, when I do eat chicken, I, I buy a local chicken. Yeah, I mean, my wife went through the same thing. She was about two months in, and she works. Here's the thing, too. Your job, what do you do? She works outside in the heat, strenuous work. She loves her job, but she there's a lot of output, a lot of energy output. And then so for her just to eat uh, plants or even processed foods or whatever, I mean, we really can't get away from that even if you try. that You're going to partake of some unless you become a raw foodist almost, right? Um, but she enjoyed it, feeling good at first just like me but then you know on into it she she had no in, no energy she became anemic she yep. started to get like i think it was pus in her eyes and stuff and her eyes began to mess with her and she had to look it up and then she was led to the same work she's type o negative and then we found the work that certain blood types need uh, certain types of meats for their diet. Even if we go to the mystical realm, we can look at the work of Santos Bonacci, who shows you that different blood types and different um, faces of the of, of the sun that you're you, that you're born under need certain types of salt, even for your body and for your for your blood type. So there's that too, and it, it, it's really deep. So she she looked that up, and so that was her thing that she, you know, she had to do, it, and then she started eating meat again, and and she felt okay. Um, that's that's the the whole thing there with the whole you know vegetarian diet and you know what you can eat um i always go back to somebody who i feel like is is like a mentor for me from beyond the grave which is manly p hall you know one of the you know the greatest mystics you know who who have, who's given us the, the information freely and i found an it was a newsletter that he put out some years ago when he was alive it was a newsletter it wasn't in a book it was just in a newsletter and he covered the topic back then. This was probably the seventies. He covered the topic of, uh, becoming a vegetarian or vegan and his stance on it was that whatever type of life you live, you could do it. Like all of these, these, the vegan bodybuilders and you know, the vegan, uh, you know, all of this stuff, they're inside, like in the, in the air conditioner all day. Or like if, it, if you're a philosopher or you're a spiritualist and you get paid to do that, you're inside. And, 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 and the words that Manly P. Hall used is that you're meditating under a tree. Then your body is going to need different types of things versus if you're a carpenter, if you're framing houses in, in the, in the sun, and then you're going to eat a salad. Like th there's different things that your body needs and there's different, uh, proteins and um, nutrients that you have to have or you're going to feel sluggish. You're going to feel bad. And, you know, it. it's different for everybody. That's the thing. And so that's what Manly P. Hall pointed out. I've actually got the article up on my website. If you probably just look up, uh, you know, Manly P. Hall vegetarian, you, it'll probably come up in Google. And so, you know, that, that was his stance on it. It was different for everybody. If you're meditating all day, if you're a guru, you live, you're sitting in the AC teaching people, whatever the case is, you may be able to eat a vegetarian diet. But if you're out there framing houses, digging ditches and yeah. under the hot sun, I don't think it's going to work. Hey, man, on the farm, uh, you know, the Mennonites are up near us and we would often do the same thing just because that's the way the days ran. Uh, you'd have your big meal at two o'clock. You know, you, you, you'd have the full on gravy with potatoes and there'd be a ham and a chicken and you'd have a salad or two salads and you'd have pie at the very end. <laughs> and people, you know, you'd be up at five. Yeah. And yeah. at two, you'd come in, you'd eat for an hour, you'd go back out, you work till seven or eight o'clock at night. And you do that every day. But if you don't have that big bulk, you know, you'd have a small little breakfast, toast, maybe a few little things like that to get you going through the day. But that rest of that bulk would take you through. Not only that, that's on a metabolism level, because I was a heavy kid, man. I was like, what, 46 inch waist, 100 pounds heavier than I was in high school. My metabolism was so slow that when I started working more on our, my family farm and sped up my metabolism and started eating that way, it leveled everything out. And now I can eat what I want, but you know, not eating. And sometimes people are consuming bad food after eight o'clock 
And just like you said, they're sitting around, so they're not burning it off. Oh, yeah. Go to sleep. gaining weight. <laughs> you go to sleep, diabetes, yeah. you know, the heart, blood pressure. There's a whole bunch of things. Your body's that are, processing it the whole, the whole time while you're sleeping after you eat that big meal or that midnight snack it. or whatever the case is, which kind of leads us to something else that, you know, even using my wife as an example, she is doing the whole intermittent fasting thing, which is getting really big. And so I think she gives herself an eight-hour window to eat. Which is kind of crazy because I've, I've, you know, there's a lot of people who don't need breakfast. They're like, oh, I never, I just eat breakfast just to eat. I feel like I need breakfast. When I wake up, like I need that to boost my metabolism or something. I need a good breakfast, especially being from a farm. I know you're the same way. Yeah. I've I've always felt like that, but she's doing a thing. She's not eating until after 10. You know, if I get up at five or six, I want my coffee and, I don't have to eat, but I feel like I do better if I if I eat. I definitely want my coffee right when I wake up. But she's giving all that up. She's not eating till she's eating from ten until six. So what's that? Uh, is that that's eight hours, right? So that's eight hours. Eight an eight hour window to eat, and and the, so the studies are showing the smaller the window. Some people do twelve hours. Some people do ten. She do she start off doing eight. It's working for her. She's losing a lot of weight. She's not even really changing up the diet that much. It's just the the uh, window of opportunity that you have to eat, so that you're so when your body is fasting, and you you eat your breakfast to break the fast, your first meal, um, your your body is burning the calories while you sleep, and it's doing that. So it's not trying to process all that food that you ate at eight eight nine o'clock. 11 o'clock when you're drinking you know what i'm saying like yeah yeah so. yeah Two thousand calories if you go and get like a burger meal or something like yeah. that you pull, put that in you at 10 o'clock and then you're just chilling for hours where are you working two thousand calories off yeah you know so and i get that window too because that's when you're probably most active so you're consuming and working it off and you're right you Six almost o'clock. don't have to worry <laughs> about all these special diets yeah. and foods because you're actually doing it and yeah. being active at those points is crucial right most people if they go to work and they're at an office they're behind a the desk, right? Yep. Um, there's a there's a lot of people doing it. Um, another comment here from Darth. He says intermittent fasting increases BDNF, a brain hormone responsible for neurogenesis. There's a bunch of cognitive stuff that that goes in 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 with that too. Um, she she's losing weight. She's feeling great. I'm probably eventually gonna do it, but I'm I'm that morning guy, man. You know, I have to eat a lot. I, I would probably do it with a 10 hour window just so I can eat at it. <laughs> you know, have, have my coffee when I get up, man. That's just, that's my guilty pleasure, man. Is that sweet coffee. I ain't going to lie to you. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Everybody. I mean, what? 90% of the world probably. What if we didn't have that magic bean? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when it comes, you talk about like what we put in our body and stuff. And uh, just before we went live, somebody was in chat. I don't, I think it was uh Davy Jones, somebody on here. Uh, was saying that he's a little bit hungover from Memorial Day weekend from drinking a lot and, you know, putting that stuff in, in his body. And I told him, said, look, I, I'm kind of the same way. I'm not hungover now, but I had a couple drinks the other night and you have to pay for it. Like the next day with age, you can't. And that's the thing that's the, the, the being discussed is like you can have a good time, but you have to, to, to pay for it. Like you pay for that good time of being open and laughing and, and cutting up and acting silly and stuff. But the next day you usually pay for it. I usually pay for it the next day. I feel sluggish. It's not that I'm hungover with a headache. Maybe there's a slight one there usually. But even after a couple beers, I feel it the next day and it doesn't feel good. Um, I don't know if it's the dehydration aspect of it. My wife big time we we had a we had a party for my uh my album release party the next night we had so many people in town and we we uh a lot of people had drinks i didn't drink anything because i drank the, the night before of my concert and i didn't like the, the next day so i was like i can't do it back to back like if i have a couple drinks one night the next night I, next day i'm probably not touching anything and it's not even like i overdo it it's just i don't know if it's that i'm not getting enough water in my body because my wife she had a good bit to drink she really did. But she started chugging water. She knew she started chugging water. The next day she woke up, she felt great. Right. She was just drinking like maybe two or three glasses of water before she went to bed. She felt great. Well, and alcohol is so dehydrative. I mean, you know, I like a couple of beers. I don't actually drink and play. I mean, I kind of went through that phase in college and university playing a lot of universities yeah. and college where it's like beer is flowing. <laughs> you know, the back room's got a keg in it for the yeah. band. You know, it's just everywhere. 
you know, uh, uh, this one house party we did, I mean, there was like an inch of beer on the floor, you know, like it was just like, so, but, but again, I, I get it because even at the end of the night, I start feeling that way. And because I like coffee so much, which is also a diuretic, I have to be careful about what I balance out. So usually if I'm gigging, most places know it's like, you got to have a pot of coffee on for Ed because he's going to be drinking that all night. And, and, um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. I'm allergic to a lot of alcohols. Yeah. I, the only kind of vodka that I've ever been able to drink when I have it is Stoli Schnoya and everything else. I break out. I swell. I turn purple. You don't want to give me scotch. I just want to fight people. If I have to go into <laughs> battle, give me a bottle of scotch. I'll drink that and go start fighting. Fight everybody you in know. the club. <laughs> yeah. You know, so like I have a couple beers, maybe a martini a couple times a year, have some gin or something like that. But you know, I, 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 it's never been my bag. You know, I, I've always been sort of like that crazy person that's always already been on the outside of the field. You know, the people like, you know, have Ed come over the party because he's a little bit crazy. Nuts, <laughs> you know, and he's going to play some songs and he's pretty theatrical. Yeah. And da, da, da. But I would have a beer and that'd be it. I'd be yeah. driving people home or trying to talk people off, you know, ledges <laughs> by going, man, you know, relax, you know, so. Yeah. I, I get it, but you know, I, I've had my share of experiences too. <laughs> yeah, when it, when it comes to playing drunk or playing while you drink, that's something for me. I've kind of had to find a safe place for me. Like if we go out to a club and there's a concert, and I'm playing, I usually play last. I'm the last act. I don't want to be. Everybody's drinking. Everybody's having fun. I want to have a little bit. So I've kind of got it down to a science what I can have before I go on or whatever the case is. I've been at house parties for uh, it was it was a house party for a, uh, a friend of mine's birthday party and they had you know what i'm saying the gym bays the guitars we were outside by the fire all jamming and i've got all these lyrics i've got a, I, man i've probably got close to 100 songs that i've written and nice. um and everybody's like come on true seeker spit something and i don't freestyle i don't do that but um but if i know my writings i just you know, i've have got an arsenal of music so they're playing music i can't remember any lyrics from you know being out there drinking with these guys and i'm like oh lord they're like everybody's waiting it's true seeking we got it. he's gonna rap i'm like i can't and i'm asking people hey like if you can give me the first word to my song that's how i am if i can know if i know the first word then i can go but i couldn't think of any lyrics man and i was like you know what when if i'm doing a paid gig and people are paying to see me like i can't let that happen at a big show so i was like you know what that happened at a small house party and I was just there. Um, so when it comes to people paying to have me out to put on a show and to perform, like I can't do it. There's no way I can get up there and forget my lyrics and, and bomb. Like I can't, I well, can and that's just that it. It's, it's that being, being cold and steely, it, you know, I allow, I allow my insanity to flow through the moment I walk into a door of a place and start talking to people doing crazy. I'm not like, you know, I do imitations and, 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 or find something happening in the club or sit down to people at a dinner table that, you know, don't even know me and pretend I'm going to start eating with them just so that it, I already start to feel comfortable in my own insanity. Because I, again, if I don't feel tactically connected and, and I don't like, you know, and why didn't I, I was thinking about doing that, but I didn't because I had too many drinks at the end of the night. I go, I get mad at myself almost because it's like, I don't want to have that experience of not knowing everything that I need to have flow through me. And at the same time, I want to make sure that I don't have what you just had that experience yeah. of forgetting something because yeah. that's the worst feeling in the world. You wrote the damn tune and you can't remember. <laughs> Give me a line, you know, uh, John Sebastian at Woodstock, you're talking about Carlos Santana. He did that in one of his tunes and he asked the audience, help me. And it, Cause he can't remember the lyric. He's probably so high. He's asking the audience, what's the lyric? And the lyric was, I must be permissive, mm -hmm. understanding of a younger generation, right? But he forgot it, right? But it, and it's on film. <laughs> it's a Warner Brothers film. <laughs> but I think that says something about your, uh, and, and our understanding of who we are and what we're doing and why we want to do it. Um, you know, I mean, and, and, and getting, I, I like to have fun too at shows, but I, it, it, it's not the same kind of fun. When I have a bunch of drinks with some buddies and we're slamming it and we're talking and having a good time and just 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 having a opening good old, up, you know, yeah, 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 it's one thing because I I don't have that responsibility. To me, it's such a great responsibility. It's like driving, 
you know, people take a drive and they just do whatever. To me, it's, 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 you know, it's a serious business. You're operating a 2000 pound vehicle down a public road at a high rate of yeah. speed. You know, it's the same thing. You're in front of an audience with 2000 watts behind your back and they're all listening to what you have to say. So it, it can be a lot of pressure. Yeah. And that's also why I think a lot of people drink. It releases them from that yeah, worry true. of what's going to happen. Right? Yeah, that's good. Um, you know, like social drinking, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of one thing. But I know people who they can't do that. Well, I don't know if they're like drinking to forget. Like we maybe drink to um, accentuate a little bit and to have fun and get loose. I know, but I come from a place where teenagers are drinking to forget. You know, things that they've been through, they're trying to um, um, drown out memories of the past, you know, and, and hurt and things like that. Um, those are another thing. When you get those people who can't do that, I've been around people who they start with drinking, but it's the it's the gateway. Like the drinking leads to crack. Like they want like not eventually, but that night, once they get so drunk, they want something else. Or I got friends who they start drinking, they want a pill. And the pill leads to crack and it leads to a weekend binge where their family hasn't seen them. Like it, it leads to that stuff. So it's very, um, it's a delicate subject, but it needs to be, it needs to be had. So like, uh, yeah. there's a, even like, we, you know, we talk about spirituality. I have a lot of people who come out of the church realm and stuff who listen to my podcast and the big, um, the big thing with the church is the art that I have against them. Cause I've seen this happen is that they, teach um uh to uh, abstinence versus moderation like they teach people to be scared of it like it is something that's going you're going if you drink alcohol you're going to be a, a, addicted versus hey here's the moderation have have this have this there's the elegance you know there's um there's ways to do it and they've they've messed a lot of people up so that they think if they drink they're going to get drunk or if they drink they're going to be addicted and they're not going to be able to stop which some people are and a lot of people who are into religion they come there because they were alcoholics or they were addicted at some point so they needed religion or religio which means to be bound or held back to show restraint you know, to tell them what to do, when to do it, when not to do it. They need that in their life. A lot of people coming off of addiction. Um, so there's that aspect there. But I would say, man, like it, it does help open you up. And maybe it's not for everybody. And this definitely should be done in moderation. I think all things in moderation, which I think the Bible teaches. But um, I always look at little things like um, I go out and eat with my father-in-law. Right. And he's, he's a really good guy. Um, I open up to him a little bit. But we'll go out and have Mexican, and I'll have a margarita, and then I'm, I'm just I'm talkative, man. I'm being myself. I'm, I'm being myself around him. I'm not trying. I'm not being reserved or what he'll think about me or whatever the case is, right? I'm able to open up in ways that I wouldn't do it if I didn't have the margarita, you know. So it could be done to drink sociably and and and, and done for you know in a good environment and, and be done well. And not what, to be scared of it. That's think insane. That if you asked him the question, and I'm sure whatever, I mean, you know, the margarita factor, whether it's, it, it, it didn't make it, whether the alcohol there is the catalyst or not, didn't it make it more real as opposed to existing in the, well, yes, you know, kind of framework yeah. of everything. Oh, yeah. Because some other real good information and strategy and planning and working over things yeah. or could all start to come out as a result of that but you're right in moderation in europe i mean we were kids i had a little wine glass it was a little tiny one about mm -hmm. this big when i was five at christmas thanksgiving easter my dad would put it's like a thimble size you know of wine in there and i would actually have that but the stigma of drinking was was kind of removed that's what almost in that way this is going to happen to you if almost is the same way of is like reverse psychology if if in, in essence you are saying moderation is the key i mean look at europe as a standard they they just don't have those kinds of issues like let's say in italy with drinking as they maybe would like maybe in the u.s as a result of that kind of behavior well, we all had a little bit uh, when we went to church because I was a Byzantine Catholic in our in the chalice when we would receive our host. It would be a small little piece of bread that was actually dipped in red wine. 
and they would top it onto your tongue with a spoon, like in The Deer Hunter. You can see that in the movie The Deer Hunter. It's the same kind of thing. They're Orthodox Catholic. But again, it, 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 hiding it and making it taboo is the worst thing because in essence, you're almost like encouraging the inquisitive <laughs> monkey factor in all of us. What's yeah. going to happen if, yeah. you know, we all want to experiment and try, right? Or like LSD or any, any drug for that matter, or like psychedelics, yeah. magic mushrooms. Don't do yeah. it because this will happen. Right. And then you find out that people are lying. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, it's not going to, I can have a drink and be okay. I can do this and, well, that's and not just it. fall and into I, and the I think, abyss. I think that when you, when you then have the uncultivated personality that is caught in depression and anxiety and other things that then use that to mask it, you're then using it for the wrong reasons. If you go to a temple in, in Tibet and they're smoking hashish out of a, of, out of a chillum before they would, they're not in, they're going into a holy state of worship. They're using it for that tool. Uh, you know, uh, George Carlin, the comedian, he would you know, he was a devout pot smoker for yeah. years and years and years. But then he said, well, I kind of stopped. I only use it now when I write. Yeah. So he uses it as an envelope to sort of like help him get out of the framework yep. of everything. And away he goes, <laughs> when he goes on stage, he's not blasting dudes behind stage before he goes. Yep. That's you funny know, you so, say that, and you actually said get out, too, because I watched the interview yesterday with Jordan Peele, which is the guy who wrote the movie Get Out, and uh, he was doing an interview with Bobby Lee, uh, the comedian, and it was like, 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 you know what I'm saying? We know you to be the funny guy. We, we know you to be real creative, but where did this movie come from? Like, the movie Get Out, so phenomenal. Um, where did this movie come out? He's like, I was scared to talk to you because I know you as my friend, the, the comedian. <laughs> Now you've reached this new level that's like you're like J.J. Abrams type. Like the movie was, I watched that movie three times and I don't rewatch movies. I watched that movie three times. Um, and he was talking about weed. He was like, you know, are you still smoking weed every day? Because they remember their college days and when they were on Mad TV. He's like, no, I'm not. I don't I don't smoke weed anymore. He's like, I'm not going to say I, I don't because I don't want to act like I'm against it but I don't smoke weed anymore. And he's like, why? He's like, you know, we, we would, we would smoke weed and stay up and we would create and, and write and come up with these crazy stories and these characters and stuff. And we'd smoke weed to write. He said, yeah, you know what? Like a lot of this stuff came through my weed smoking. He said, uh, he said, you know, a lot of the story came out of me smoking pot, but he said the execution came when I quit. Like I had all these stories, had all these great ideas, but that's all they were. But it was when I quit smoking pot that I was able to execute on these stories and these dreams and things, which is really cool. Kind of like me, I think, like I'm always talking about the psychedelic experience with my story and like magic mushrooms. Like I've went in on, on those encounters, had these visions about this podcast, what I want to do for a living and how to do it. I even knew how to do it. Like I was given almost instructions from God or the angels or whatever. Um, came out of that realm. With some friends, they want to go back next weekend. I'm doing it again next weekend, bro. I'm going to, like, no. It's going to take me months to kind of unpack this information that came out of that 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 realm, you know. Um, so going in the realm to get the vision, to get the creativity, the ideas, and then coming back to execute and say, how do we make this stuff work? How do we see manifestation from the stuff we're pulling out of the ethers? You know what I'm saying? So I, I see my story in that as well. I get it, man. And you know what? While you're talk talking, I remember Carlos Santana in an interview. He was talking about he he was on an acid trip, and he had called his friend because he was having a really bad trip. And uh, his buddy was his name was Stan Markham. He was a barber, so he comes and picks him up. And you know, as they're driving through San Francisco, and he's taking Carlos wherever he's taking Carlos. He said, "So, like, you know, what do you want to do with your life?" And it, Carlos Carlos was pretty young at the time. And he goes, well, I really want to play my guitar and, like, you know, connect my energy with everything. And, and, and Stan said, OK, well, let's do it. Like, stop talking about it and let's actually do it. And he became his first manager and helped put the band together. And before you knew it, they were playing Woodstock, you know, within years of that experience that he had as a young man. So I think that says a lot even about like I've, I've heard other people say, you know, like we talk about drinking. You know, write drunk and edit sober because there's <laughs> there's that aspect. It's like, well, you have all these this flow of energy and stream of consciousness. It may not all be right yet, but 
ha having the clarity to go back and look and go, wait a minute, you know, this, I was being crazy and da, 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 but this, yeah, I, I get where this is going. And it all starts to filter into the exact same way. I've had those exact same epiphanies with experiences I've had where it's like, I'm going to college and I'm going to become a bass player. And I did it. I remember being a kid and just like in a drug experience where you, I had a dream and I couldn't skate like everybody else in the neighborhood. I could see myself in my dream skating. And I was like, you know, at the time, Daryl Sittler from the Toronto Maple Leafs. And there I was doing what I was doing. The very next day I went out to that cow pasture and I could skate because I could see it and feel it and yeah. understand it and participate in my dream. And mm. it solidified everything. And all of a sudden, click, 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 I'm doing it. Yeah. And, and, and then it feeds itself after yeah. the fact. You almost don't need the other part anymore because I'm you're, you're seeing everything start to unfold. And yep. it's like, boom, 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 boom. So, yeah, man, I, I get it completely. That was um, like some of the information I pulled out of the, the state on my first um, psilocybin encounter was the fact that we had went and seen a healer, um, someone who does Reiki and they do it full time a thriving business off of leading people in meditation and, and moving energy around. And I was just elated, man. I, I loved it. And, um, went in that night on, uh, psilocybin and we went to a float tank experience and I had this overwhelming feeling within me that I wanted to do what this lady was doing. I wanted to be a healer full time. And it was just thing like in your vision, in your dream, you want to be a healer or you want to be a skater I want to do this. I want to do that. Whatever your dream is, whatever your vision is, whether you're on psilocybin or you just go into the dream state every night when you go to sleep, um, you're able to pull that out. But the fact that was being the, the information that was being communicated to me was that you're not going to be a healer. You're already a healer. Like you're already a skater. That's already within you. You're not one day going to become it. It's the fact that we need to manifest it and we need to pull it out. Those dreams are there. Those desires are there for a reason. And it's uh. I had a different um, affiliation with music and the things I spoke of myself. I remember that country song. I'm going to be somebody someday. And that was like a good song. And I'm like, you know, what? I'm not going to be somebody one day. I'm not going to be a healer. I'm already am. So don't look at it as something outside of yourself, but it's something that you already are, but you just have to manifest it and you have the power to do that. And that was the beautiful thing with psychedelics for me. Beautiful. And you know what? That's so true because it separates you again from that conditioning. All those things that say no and all those things that say yes at the same time, that, that yes, you are already that, that you're this. You are at this age in school and da 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 da. That's just the, 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 the forward framework of our perception in the conscious mind now. But everything else, that feeling of like, wait a minute, this is why I'm supposed to be here. It's already predestined. It's already part of what I know from the, my inception of thought, of cognitive thinking. I gravitate to this because of this feeling and how it makes me feel. You can look back and see the channel and the funnel of it. But at the same time, it's hard to because there's so many exterior aspects of it that make you sometimes question it. Do I? Am I? All of those things that, that make people stop or hinder them say, well, yeah, I wanted to do this, but I thought this was a better idea. But that want, that need is the same feeling that you have in that, that original feeling of like, I want to do this. I'm excited about doing this because of the way it makes me feel and the way it makes other people feel. That is godlike in essence because you're coming more connected to who you really are. Yeah. That your destiny, your, yeah, <laughs> and, and your destiny of being here. Your, yeah. The reason that you're, you know, like people say, well, destiny, psh, you know, everybody says the hippie, trippy, artsy, fartsy, da 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 da. The reason that um, people go to galleries, the Louvre, uh, you know, museums, uh, the intellectual properties offices that exist in our governments are collecting and have this information is because. Future generations of people need to look at these human experiences and the things that we've said and how we've said them. They define who we are, just like that Herbie Hancock quote. Uh, my wife, she's a potter. She makes dishes, cups, bowls, plates, sculptural stuff and everything. But one of the things we share as an interest is ancient archaeology. And it never ceases to amaze me. People are digging through the dirt, sand, rubble, going down feet. You know, and all of a sudden they find a pottery shard. 
And on the pottery shard is scribbled this symbol might look like somebody fishing a woman receiving the fish, you know, that scrap of artwork that somebody took that's buried in the ground, forgotten about for thousands of years can later be dug up and looked at us to understand who we were, to understand more about who we are, the possibilities of where we can go. All of those kinds of things are that barbaric yelp of human existence from the mortal coil that says, I need to tell you about this because I'm seeing it, I'm feeling it. That, yeah. that in essence is, is, is like, you know, I always say music to me is like church. It's like going to church when I, when I'm playing and I'm, and I'm singing and I'm doing something, it is like a religious experience. Yeah. It's like I'm having fun playing the tune and it might be nutty and yeah. da, 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 da. but dude, that whole connectiveness to everything and even why the tune got written is yeah. all part of that, you know, like, Holy well, like the yeah. early music, man. I did a I did an episode with um, what's his name? I can't think of his name right off. Uh, Eric Dollard, and so he's talking about the early music that was made, like the Mozarts, the the Box, the Beethoven. Like these people made created the music to like create a psychedelic experience or create a divine encounter with God, and they were done in these big cathedral churches. And if you sat in the middle and they had the pipes and the horns, like this music was done in such a way to make you encounter God through the music or what we call the God. And you would essentially go there and be taking, take, like leave your body when the music's played with in, in, in the right setting in these huge cathedrals where one note would just echo and done in such a way, man. Um, and we, we did a, a whole podcast where this guy just went in with the information on that. And I've, re, I've related it back to spirituality. He's more of a, a like of the, of the scientific mind, you know, and, and telling you scientifically what it does to your body. I'm bringing it back to spirituality and some of the spiritual stuff in scriptures and stuff. And I'm bringing it out. And it was just a beautiful podcast, man. But like it was done in such a way of having this encounter, even the way they designed the, um, um, architecture, the the, you know, what I'm saying the buildings, the the cathedral, the the organs, all of this stuff was done in such a way that you go there and you close your eyes and you sit there and you could be t you can essentially be pulled out of your body. And I think that that happens still. Even I was just listening to some some music by uh, a Perfect Circle, and you know, tears were coming in my eyes, and I closed my eyes and I just sat there for a minute, and it took me to that place. Same thing whether you're in a worship gathering at church or if you're a Muslim or whatever, wherever you are, you're connecting with the creator through the uh, music and you're having a supernatural encounter by listening to this music, man. And it's done. I mean, it's beautiful. And that's one thing I do like about church, man, is what and I've talked about this a lot lately is like they are still holding on even if it's not done right i don't go to church but it's not done right but it's still an essence there of that tribal mentality of the rhythm of the drums putting you into a state of hypnosis uh going into trances got your hands raised your eyes closed and you're like connecting with the divine that's ancient like that's that's and it's not just for christians it's not just done in churches i did it earlier when i listened to a perfect circle which is not a christian band or whatever but it was something spiritual that helps you connect that with the lyrics that they were saying and the vibration of the music man it's it's beautiful and there's nothing like it power no, of music. you're right and and those churches it's it, it, uh, totally there are like reverberation chambers yep. for these exquisite mathematically designed and yet at the same time felt uh compositions that in a place like that amplifies and resonates with all of their divinity. I mean, even ancient buildings in Egypt all have these frequencies and reverberative qualities to them. They even say Stonehenge has acoustical yeah. properties to yeah. it. Yeah. The universe itself gives off frequency. Our planet gives off a frequency. In fact, it's been increasing in the Fibonacci sequence since scientists have started to measure it um all of that tells me that the universe the cosmos our existence and everything that is is a symphony mm -hmm. it's like string yeah. theory everything yeah. vibrating collating sometimes working in harmony sometimes 
dissonance and catastrophe. You have a planetary explosion or something that's going on in the universe or a supernova that's exploding, you know, all of that then has consequence to everything, even in the jungle. Yeah. Where the, they've removed a certain species as a, as a result of like deforestation, other insects and amphibians and animals will start to mimic the sounds of those lost species in order to help perpetuate the sort of harmony of the jungle in terms of its sound. Uh, all of that says something about, you know, even in, in the morning when you hear a bird chirping. You know, like, I mean, the frequency of that bird is telling you something. It, it, you gets, know, like, it gets as deep as you want it to be, man. Like, exactly, uh, there's a exactly. scripture in the Bible, and I always used to just read over it, but it talks about, it says that if we cease to praise God, it says that even the rocks would cry out praises to, to God. And so essentially it's telling you the moral is continue to praise, because if you don't, something's going to take your place, and you have the opportunity to to be an instrument of righteousness, to, to send praise back to the Creator. But to break it down to an esoteric level, the rocks are vibrating. The rocks yeah. hold frequencies, crystals, energy. Like the earth is creating a resonance and making a sound. There are microphones that can record it. The trees produce more like a, a metronome or a drum beat, like a heartbeat almost. And it's like everything working together. The birds, when you hear all the birds singing together, um, the earth it sounds like birds singing, honestly, when you, when you re- record that. Um, the sound of the sun, the frequency of the sun. That's why in the uh, hin- Hindu tradition, they chant the Om, which is the Om. It's the sound of the sun. So they're joining, essentially joining with all creation to praise the creator. I mean, Pythagoras, we're talking about... some. Uh, somebody who's like the chief guy on mysticism and music and how it works together. They had certain instruments they wouldn't play. Now, you know, they, they uh, wouldn't touch cymbals at all. They thought that the crash and is not good for the body. Uh, they had different beliefs. They didn't eat beans. They had a esoteric meaning behind that. So they had some stuff that was a little weird, but they started and ended each day with praises to the creator. As the sun rose, they joined with the sun singing praises when the sun um, set, they sung praises. It started and ended each day with that praise. And so uh, j- that that music, that symphony, everything is singing praises to the Most High. There's a uh, there's a, a, a there's a, um, a mantra that I love. It's called Ramadasa. It's Ramadasa sa se so hung. Repeat that in a in a in a in a, in a place of of silence and of uh, a state of meditation. It's joining with the sun, with the moon, with the earth and all of the energies and praising the creator. And it's a it's a it's a Vedic song. It's beautiful, man, of joining with all creation to sing praises, not just you with your church or you with your group or you yourself, but joining with all creation, being one with that energy, lifting up those praises, man. That's beautiful. Everything is praising. Mm hmm. Amen, man. You know what? And, and that's <laughs> your the church thing. for the day. <laughs> my mom, my, yeah, my mom would say, you know, don't forget to say a prayer for so and so, or don't forget to pray for da 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 da. And you know, I, I'm a if I'm going to pray, I'll say like a hail mary or something like that. I, I'm, I'm very into the the concept of you know the Venus culture and at the same time the mm-hmm. worship of, of feminine because yeah. it, it, sometimes it disgusts me what I see going on with women today and, and the way that they behave or act and uh at the same time you know i'd rather pick up my guitar and spend those moments for 15 or 20 minutes playing something that has that connection to prayer in that regard like i might not be saying words but i'm playing notes and feeling and projecting those those feelings Energies, to yeah. Who, yeah to whoever it is um so you know i always remind my mom well yeah you know I'm always praying every time I pick up my guitar. Right? So, uh, yeah. but yeah, I, and, and, and that's the thing the Bible, many, many, uh, ancient cultures are filled with f- stories of frequency song. Uh, and, and, and I mean, look at, you know, the walls of Jericho, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> Bob Marley is one of my big influences. Yeah, and I love definitely. the things that he's had to say about, 
a lot of those connections to music when it hits you you feel no pain yeah man or like being so prolific by saying you know and casting true words in the face of 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 infamy why boast to thyself O evil man playing smart but not being clever i said you're working iniquity to achieve vanity yeah if i so i so Mm -hmm. but the goodness of jaja I do ring forever, right? Like, I he's I love somebody calling the shots. I mean, you know, a lot of religious figures that we look back in history have all gone in and shook in the pot. Yeah, it, it, out of necessity, and it yep, kind of wakes yep. people up necessity, so that they go, yeah. "Hey, man, this is like you know, people talk about you know, money and the stability." Of hey, man, Christ was radical. He went in and turned over the tables. I mean, he beat those guys up at the temple. He let yep. the people in, in in those places know that this is heresy. Yeah, what, what you're saying and preaching is wrong. Well, you know what? These are our standards. These uh, Agnaton, the great Egyptian. You know, he he proclaimed that this polytheistic religion is ridiculous. You're just making money from the people. We're going to worship the sun, yeah, the Aten, mm-hmm. and we're going to move everything to Amarna, and we're going to set up a new civilization. Well, they tried to shut him down too. Yep. And Nefertiti and then his son, you know, it's King Tut. Everybody knows who Tut is. But they try to erase that entire dynasty based on a culture that wanted to start worshiping the thing that gives us life, the sun. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah, you know, and that's the beauty of it, man. It's like everything is an expression of that one creator, that divine essence. Uh, everything, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, we look, you know, I've, I've, we, we talk a lot about like, uh, the allegory within the Bible about it me, being allegory about you and your spiritual journey and your life. And these people in the old Testament, whether they existed or not, they exist there to tell a story about you. And it's not that if they existed is the principle, but is that if you understand the allegory and apply it to your life is why that's those, those stories are there. And it goes the same thing with the, um, you know, the Vedic traditions and the Hindus and stuff, and they still have the same thing. It's not like we worship a thousand gods or the unknown gods or whatever. It's like, no, like in, in, in these gods, these little gods are expressions of the bigger divine essence that we worship. We don't like worship all of these gods, but they're, they're personifications of this one just like in Christianity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're all like personifications of the one. Uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. You know, it's all about the oneness uh, of it all in, in, in those religions and stuff. So if you can understand that, then you you can go straight to the source versus be, going to your priest or whatever the case is or going to this one person to go to God for you is that we're all connected to that oneness, is, which is beautiful, which is the story of Jesus and why he flip the, the you know the, the tables and the money changers and and everything so being a revolutionary man and you yeah, don't need man. nothing nothing outside of yourself everything is within and so and that's the powerful thing about music i think it helps you go within you don't need nothing you are, outside you of yourself. are the messenger man you are the radical which ultimately can be love if it's wielded in the right way you that's know it. um i i brought this lyric so he's talking about different things and, and archetypes and stuff and it was a song I played all the time, but about taking a ride in the universe on UFO and all the <laughs> things that they had in the UFO. And one of the things I say in the lyric is they had Muhammad, Jesus, Buddha, Moses, Shiva, Allah, Dalai Lama rolled into one. Right. So it's like it's it's all the same aspect of. But that's the which thing. is you, <laughs> which is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah all like, of that's within in my you. Gar- yeah. in, in my garden, I plant and I weed. But. There's tomatoes, there's peppers, there's lettuce, there's corn, there's spinach, there's everything. I grow so many different things, but they all live in harmony. Yeah. The potatoes don't argue with the peppers. The tomatoes don't beat up the corn. They all sustain, live together. And they sustain me. It is God-like in that sense. And in essence, I'm almost playing God as a result of that cultivating um, yeah creating. cultivating it and 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 society kind of works almost sometimes in the same fashion in regards to that but what you decide to cultivate weed out and allow to flourish you know um again it becomes about choices um but yeah 
we could go on and on. And we we've, we've already went. <laughs> we're like I a, know, min- I a know, minute bro, shy I know. of two hours. I plan to do an hour with you, but it's been great. Everybody's enjoying it in the chat, and I know everybody's enjoying Good. it. Listen to it on the podcast. Why? Because we enjoyed it. Good organic conversation, man. And I was just thinking about that the other day. I was like, I like to get deep. I like to talk about spirituality, the divine essence, but I like to talk about music too. So it's good that we got to combine the two, man. And so it's a a breath of fresh air and just having conversation versus I'm here to sell something. Like you were just here, man. So we got a few minutes left, brother. Go ahead and let people know where they can check out your music and what you bring to the table. You uh have you, you've been on a lot of podcasts. You got some good conversations and stuff to bring to the table. But let them know where they can check out your work. Well, thanks a lot, man, Derek. Really for having me. It's a great conversation, like you said. Um, and the opportunity means a lot, dude. Really. Uh, EdRoman.net is my website. You can get all my social networking buttons there. What do I got? Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. My YouTube channel is through there as well. You can check me out most places on the internet at Special Ed Roman on any social networking platforms. Latest record that's out is Red Omen. In the process of about to release a major video working with There Be Dragons Creative Media in New York City, who's done SpongeBob SquarePants, Kung Fu Panda 2, a number of different things for Nickelodeon and Teletoon. So I'm really excited about sharing that because a third of the proceeds through the fundraising campaigns we're doing are going for tutoring programs for kids that can't afford it through the Dyslexia Society. So if if you're following that, ride the bus, come by for the ride. It's going to be a lot of fun. The video is insane and it's crazy. And I can't even believe we did it. We actually (laughs) made it happen. So so thanks again, really, for the opportunity, man. It's, it was great talking to you. I'd love to hang out sometime. Again. Yeah, we'll do. We'll do it again, brother. Thank you so much for coming on hanging out. Anytime. All right, brother. Respect. Shalom, shalom. Respect. Peace. Shalom. Ed Roman, ladies and gentlemen. Really cool interview. Like I said, a breath of fresh air just because, like, I've been wanting to just hang out, you know, and not feel like we have to produce or it has to be spiritual. Like, I got a lot of spiritual people lined up. Everything is spiritual. So that's why we're talking about music at the very beginning. And we kind of tied it in to let you know that, look, everything is spiritual. Everything. So it's cool to to approach the spiritual power of music. I mean, that's what I do. I love it. Good stuff. Make sure y'all check out his work. Um, if anybody has any questions, be sure to let me know. And I'll try to answer them. I do want to address something that somebody posted. This was by Christy. Uh, Christy, folks, she wanted to know was satan the chief of music um and i i say no uh satan was not the chief of music uh it does talk about an angelic being it actually it talks about the name of that being i think it's tars tardis prince of tardis or something like that um but no i don't think that's satan i don't think that um that's something that was uh, perpetuated, I guess, by the church or whatever, to dealing with music. But I don't think that there's any um, linkage to that entity, that angel being Satan. I think how they link that entity to Satan is that because it fell. It was cast down. It was cast out. But we got to understand, like, that happened to angelic beings all the time or happened to presences that was on world rulers or nebuchadnezzar or the the pharaohs and things they were rose to power and then they fell because of their pride like that that happens all the time um even in in, in the term lucifer if we read in isaiah chapter 14 like lucifer's not even the devil and this is a big one too the, the term lucifer like lucifer is a title and I, I blow people's minds with this. We're Lucifers. We're light. The word Lucifer means bearer of light, bringer of light. Who is the, the true uh, Lucifer, bright and morning star? Who was called the bright and morning star in the Bible? It's Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach. He was called the bright and morning star. It's also called the day star. Danny got it right. Lucifer is a Latin word for light bearer. So when it's talking about Lucifer in uh, Isaiah chapter 14, this is the only time that that word is mentioned in the entire Bible. Lucifer one time. It also goes on to say morning star. But we have to understand what is the morning star? It's Venus. You can actually go up. You can pull out on Google and go to like dictionary.com and look up the word Venus it'll say that it's Lucifer. You can look up the word Lucifer. It'll say it's a uh, synonym for Venus. They're they're interchangeable. They're one and the same. 
that being said, it means because it's the bright and morning star that as you go out and you stargaze and you're out at four in the morning, five in the morning, the brightest, it says star, but it's a planet. It's an entity, <laughs> probably. The, the brightest star in the morning sky is Venus. It's the brightest one out there until the sun, which is symbolic for God or Jesus, the sun rises and that star is cast out of heaven in all of its glory as the sun takes its rightful place in the sky. And so when the sun rises, all of those stars bow down to his glory, his magnificent. Uh, and, you know, that's that's what it's about. It's it's all allegory and it all has to do with that. So look that up. Um, so when it's being used there in Isaiah 14, it's it's used there as um, it's used there as being um, an allegory for Nebuchadnezzar who fell from his glory and as he fell and it tells you it's a man it doesn't say angel it says isn't this the man that did cause the nations to tremble isn't this the man so it kind of it kind of explains it for you there i don't know why they uh tried to tell us that it was it was the devil or the devil and lucifer thing it's kind of weird but as far as breaking down who that really was in isaiah 14 um ruach says derek you're wrong ezekiel 28 says lucifer was the head of worship in heaven. I'm pretty sure that I'm right. Um, we'll look it up though, just so I don't want to give out bad information here. Maybe I'm wrong and I have to repent, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. I'm pretty sure that uh, Lucifer is only used one time in the Bible and it's used in Isaiah 14. So let me just go here. I'm going to show you guys. Let's see. Here's my E sword application. And if, it, if I'm wrong, I'll admit it and I'll repent. Let's see. Type in Lucifer. The only time Lucifer is used is in Isaiah 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? People just, the uh, the Isaiah 28 thing, that's talking about a different angel, man. And people, for some reason, this preconceived notion, because an angel fell, they're trying to say that Satan fell from grace, Lucifer fell. But this Lucifer here is um, it's not even talking about an angel or the devil. It's talking about, it's an allegory. Let's see. And it's, ta it's talking about um, Nebuchadnezzar. For thou hast said in thine heart. Okay, we'll start with 12, I guess. Uh, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of north. So this is Isaiah prophesying against the king of Babylon. 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. In allegory, the sun is God. Just like in all ancient cultures, the sun God, the sun is God. Um, even in Psalms, it says the Lord thy God is a sun and a shield. The Lord thy God is a sun and a shield. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So in the allegory there, we see Venus, the morning star, the brightest thing. Look upon me, upon my glory until the sun rises and your glory is gone. You're cast out of heaven. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So he's saying just like Venus is cast out of the night sky, so you'll be brought down too. If you don't repent and you don't quit torturing God's people, you're gonna, you, this is going to happen to you. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee saying, here's, here's your key. Isaiah 14, 16. This is what they say when they see you. Is this the man that made the earth to tremble? that did shake kingdoms that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof that opened the house of his prisoners. All the Kings of nations, even all of them lie in glory, everyone in his own house, but thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch. And so it talks about him falling from all of his glory. And it says in chapter 16, is this the man is this the spirit? No. 
Is this the angel? No. Is this the devil? No. Is this Lucifer? No. Is this Satan? No. Is this the man that made the earth to tremble and did shake kingdoms? This is allegory, people. We have to understand that. So, yeah, the only time um, Lucifer is mentioned in the Bible is Isaiah 14. So to say that Lucifer was the chief of heaven, you, you're not going to get that word anywhere else in the Bible. That's just from um, traditions. And we know what the scripture talks about, the traditions of men. So it's not about following traditions about what we heard. We have this preconceived notion that when we read that, we automatically tie that to this angel that fell in Ezekiel or whatever the case is that was doing this. And, that, and, and some people even believe, some scholars believe that that's actually talking about a person in Ezekiel 28. So you got to do the, you got to do the research. And so that's who Lucifer is. I hope that helped. And uh, that, that throws, um, I say throws a lot of people off that um, because we're, we're told that that word is a bad word. And, it, and the Lucifer, the bright and morning star, like the Bible calls Jesus the morning star. We talk about Amen Ra, the sun god. Jesus is called the Amen, the the Amen, the last, the final word. Jesus is called the Amen. Like when you pray in the name, it gets deep. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go too deep into that. But uh, anyway, that's what Lucifer is, and that's um what it has to do with with the scriptures and so it's all symbolic even satan i'm I'm not i don't even know that satan uh is like an entity like like a a, a devil like we all can become satan's so the when you break down the word satan the word means uh deceiver or or adversary and we can all become the adversary as well so because we see jesus calling satan i mean we see jesus calling peter a satan because he becomes an adversary to the will of God and what Jesus was supposed to do. Je Jesus rebukes Peter and says, get behind me, Satan, for you have not in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And so this, we all can play that role. We all can uh, uh, be Satans at times. And um, so that, that's what that is. It's a title. All of this stuff is titles, man. It's titles because it's personifications. It's roles um that 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 have been here since the beginning and so as far as thinking that the satan is this um entity that's going to overthrow god one day or try to fight god um that's that's totally not what the bible paints out with uh, with good and evil this war between good and evil is that the war between good and evil is the war that's being fought within your soul with the, between uh your eyes right there at the uh the mount of golgotha the hill which is the place of the skull. This is where we are to be crucified daily, even. We are to pick up our cross as we are going to die uh, daily upon that cross. And so that's what's going on, to be crucified to our emotions. And, um, yeah, so, Ruach, I agree with you there. You said Satan is no match for God. Definitely is no match. Uh, nothing is, is a match for God. He created anything. I don't think that he would create an entity that... Um, that he would confuse to think that he was a, a match for God in, in that way. But uh, if Satan is an entity or entities of, of darkness or evil, whatever we would do to oppose the will of God, um, it's it's uh, he that he or they work with God like God opens up uh, doors for these entities to come through. Have you considered my servant Job, you know, Satan? going back and forth throughout the earth. Have you considered my servant Job? He said, well, if you take, yeah, Job, Job loves you because you bless him. Job loves you because you take care of him because he had a hedge of protection around him. He said, if you take that hedge of protection off of Job, um, he'll curse you and die. And he would. And um, so he said, no, he wouldn't. Job loves me. And so there's that whole story about Satan petitioning God. Um, but he, he works, you know, for God. He doesn't work against God. It's to, to truly understand the sovereignty of God. And if you want to, to, to do that, I talk about this all the time, but if you want to go on your own studies, if you even care to, um, you can look up in the Bible what is called evil angels or evil spirits. And it talks about that God sends out these evil angels. God sends out evil spirits. God sends out infirmities and spirits and confusion sent from God. Um, some people, when they try to get a grasp of this or they don't like that notion that God is responsible for everything. Um, 
they don't like that. They come into a more of a Gnostic approach and a Gnostic Gnosticism, which would teach you that the God of the Old Testament is a separate God of the God of the the New Testament. But but it's not it's it's one in the same. And that's why I, I personally like to look at the God of the Old Testament in, in more of an allegorical form um, where it talks about that. I am the Lord, thy God. I create good and evil. I create light and darkness. God sends forth evil angels. And just to give you a, just a quick summary, because we did talk about it here on the on the podcast, where uh, God, where the demon that was tormenting Saul, the evil spirit, that was sent from God. God sent that evil spirit to Saul to torment him. So the fact that you're God, who is all loving, all knowing, like he sent out, he sends out evil spirits, but for good reason. He sends them out. Let's let's say that it's for good reason. I believe. I believe that even Paul talks about that when he uh, had this spirit of infirmity, a messenger of Satan. What is a messenger of Satan? It's a demon. That's what we would call a demon or an evil, evil spirit. This messenger of Satan, a spirit of infirmity, which is a spirit of sickness that Paul had. And he said, Lord, I've sought you on three occasions through fasting and through prayer for you to take this demon away from me. Um, you won't do it, but you've only answered me and said, my grace is sufficient. My grace is enough. And so Paul gets the revelation that this entity, this spirit was sent to him to buffet him, to work on him, to carve him, to, to keep him humble because he was traveling back and forth from heaven to earth. He was having out of body experiences. He was having a lot of angelic encounters and healings and miracles and crazy stuff and says so that he wouldn't get too prideful. God loved him enough to buffet him and send this 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 messenger to him, this messenger of Satan, and, and God wouldn't take it away. And so I, I, I really do think it, it paints another picture, man, of the sovereignty of God, of how all things work together for the good of those who love him. All things, not some things, not just the good things work in my favor, but all things work together for the good of those who love him. I believe it, man. I'm a walking example of that. And I think we all are. This battle of good and evil is going on within our heart. And it's uh, it's only 12 inches, 12 inches long. 12 inches is the uh, the uh, measurement of from our mind to our heart. And that's the, the 12 inches right there. And so one thing about the mind and the heart that uh, I, I did see that that Brenda mentioned a little bit earlier. Brenda said that um, it's when the mind and heart connect. Brenda Bradshaw. Um, and it's true because there's so much power there. When we understand when the Bible's talking about salvation, it says that in, in Romans, Romans 10, I believe it, it says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. This is it. It's just a confession thing. So it's one thing when we are um, I'm trying to be funny, Ruach. <laughs> I'm not going to repeat that. Um, it's one thing when we uh, when we believe something. It's one thing to believe in Jesus. It's one thing to believe in your dreams. It's one thing to believe in truth. It's one thing to believe in righteousness. We can believe it all we want. We all believe in, in something greater than ourselves. But if we but if we speak it out, we create it. So it's part of our mind or our heart and then connecting in the middle with our breath. And we create it as we speak it. That's where the power is, man. It talks about it there. And I, I believe it. it's one thing to wish goodwill upon someone or whatever the case is. Or it's almost like the faith without works is dead. Like, yeah, I know you have. I know you believe in this or you believe in me or you believe in that. Show me. Show me that you believe in me. Show me that, uh, you know, it's talking about faith without works that you see a hungry person walking down the street and hey man i hope you get something to eat one day i'm with you my heart goes out to you but you have the ability to bless that person right then and you don't do it faith without works is dead that's what it's talking about so there's the power when our heart or our mind and it comes into agreement with the things that we're speaking out that life and death are in the power of the tongue and we create life, we create our journey or whatever we, we want to create. We, we have the um, the ability to do so and uh, and try it. It works for me. And I like to talk about what's working. Not, not, you know, I talk about the failures, too, just so you can kind of learn from them. And I, I love to have other people on to talk about their failures and stuff, too. But I want to focus on what's working. And so that's what's working. Positive confessions work. Um, some people believe in faking it till you make it. Uh, there's another aspect of that, of just simply, 
uh, coming to grips with the fact that, you know, you have something wrong with you or you need help. There's that too. So, um, you know, I'm, I've kind of, I'm kind of in the middle there. I know, you know, we confession is positive, man. Like it's not just confessing though. It's confessing, but you have to be a doer of the word. You have to actually go out there and put your hand to the plow and not, not look back, put your hand to the plow and not look back. Cause if you look back, you're not fit for the kingdom. You're going to turn into a pillar of salt. That's why I, I'm working on a study on this too. We talk about, cause there's a connection there where I always talk about, and this pisses a lot of people off, but I talk about the connection between the Kundalini and the Holy spirit and this life force and this inner essence that is animates all life. And it's there. And then if we get quiet and we focus on our breathing and we get into prayer, we can feel the Holy spirit Kundalini or whatever. So in the Kundalini realm, there's madness. So people say, if you, if you, um, open your third eye or you get filled with the Kundalini and you depart from it, you'll go crazy. People will go crazy when step power is released within them. But then they say, you know, in Christianity, there's a difference there because the Holy Spirit's a perfect gentleman. He's not going to, you're not going to go crazy. Um, you know, that's not a side effect. Yes, it is. And I think it's coupled with those scriptures that says he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom. He who starts off and, 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 and then turns their back on the things of God. It says it's impossible to do that. But if you try to do it, like you'll go mad too. If you run from God, if you open up those energies, it's nothing to play with. It's nothing to play with. Because if we really look into these churches, man, and see how many people are delusioned there, disillusioned, how many people there have say, God told me this, God told me that. And in their hearts of hearts, the Holy Spirit told me this. Holy Spirit ain't tell you nothing. You're making it up as you go. Because the Holy Spirit's telling you one thing, he's telling this person another thing, and he's confusing y'all. He's creating schisms within your church. Somebody's lying. Somebody's lying. I really, I, I feel like it's the same energy, man. I think that there's a lot of disillusioned people there who, uh, wicked people there who move with that energy and they use it for good, and the other people use it for evil. We, I think it's a perfect example is watching Star Wars. And seeing that same force, that same life energy that we can all tap into, and we all do, we all tap into that energy, but you're on that path. It's a narrow road. If you go too far to the left, too far to the right, you're going to be off. So we, I think that, that allegory there uh, in the movie Star Wars, dealing with the force, um, is, is, is perfect, man, of, of seeing how someone can use this same energy in this same... Man, look up, look up. I mean, I don't know how deep y'all want to go, man, but uh, look up. The, there's a movie. Uh, it's called Marjo. M-A-R-J-O. Marjo. I bought this movie. I bought the, I've got the VHS or DVD somewhere. I think DVD, yeah. Um, Marjo was a child preacher. And his parents um, taught him how to preach when he was a baby. So he... um. You may, I don't know if you can find the full documentary on, um, on YouTube, but, but they, his parents taught him how to, how to preach. And for those of you who are watching, I'm going to show you a little clip of Marjo. And if you're listening, you can hear it, but this is young Marjo. His parents told him how to, how to preach. And if I were to choose my own subject, I would have brought you a message on the love of God. Anyway, it's this little bitty kid. And he's like four years old, three years old, five, whatever. He made a living for his family preaching. Uh, parents teaching him how to preach. Watch this documentary. And it shows you someone who was brought up in the church realm. It shows you someone who was brought up learning how to preach. And that was their profession. But then he has like a come to Jesus moment. Uh, when he gets older, because he don't even believe in God anymore. He's like, you don't know if he ever did when he, be, be, you know, becomes a young man, probably 18 or so. And he gets into the hippie movement in the seventies and he's into the hippie stuff and he don't even believe in God anymore. But by, pro, by, by profession, he was still a preacher. He can move crowds. He knew the art of preaching and how to move people to tears and all of this stuff. Um, so anyway, he went on one last preaching uh crusade and it was like a tour almost but he said you know what i can't go on doing this this isn't my calling even though this is what i do for money like he tried to leave 
but he didn't want to go to work. So he came back to do to preaching because it paid the bills. So he went on this one last crusade and he said, look, I'm going to film it behind the scenes and show you guys the flaws within this church system and what really goes on behind the scenes and stuff. So he does one last tour and he's filming everything and he's just showing you who he is and who he really is. And he don't want to live a double life. So it, it's kind of nasty, but it it's it's honorable that he pulled out at the end. <laughs> he pulled out at the end so that he, uh, you know, he, he didn't want to do that no more. He felt like he was deceiving people. And it, I don't think it's his fault. I think it's his parents' fault. He was a little baby. Like he married somebody at like four years old. He's doing like wedding processions and stuff. Anyway, the documentary is, is called Marjo. His name is Marjo Gortner and, um, very eye opening and enlightening documentary. And it just shows you that there's a path to be, to be, t- so I, I mean, you know what I'm saying? I, I, you know, my, my hat goes off to the man for coming out and saying, look, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to show y'all what I'm doing. So, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I enjoyed it, but it may make you look at church stuff <laughs> a different way. So it may, maybe not. It's on you. Pray about it. So with that being said, I'm going to say thank you guys, man. Peace and Shalom. Uh, thank you guys for supporting my work. Everybody who does that through Patreon at any level of giving per per month, man, anywhere from a dollar, five, ten, twenty, whatever you can do, uh, all of it helps. And you get a bunch of cool stuff. You get my um, entire discography, and you get new music before it's released. You get partial releases. Like I'll put out something. Like I worked on something yesterday, and I I needed a, another ear i needed somebody to help me with the song so I, I i sent it out and it's on there now it's a course that i recorded i didn't know if it was if it had potential so i sent it out there to get some feedback and a bunch of people wrote me back and got to check it out so you get access to that kind of stuff that i put out there uh, full discography and also the school of the mystics every thursday night you get access to that by becoming a patron even for a dollar if a dollar is all you can do like it it goes a long way so thank you guys for supporting my work shout out to everybody who's been doing that Shout out to everybody holding me down in the chat room when we go live here. Christy Folks, Christy Lee, Chris Bars, Carolyn, um, Darth, Ruach, all the people I forgot to mention. The stream moves pretty fast. <laughs> so uh, Carolyn says, Shalom, such a nice show today. Great chat room ideas being floated. No doubt. I love watching. <laughs> they tell you not to watch the text and stuff so you'll be engaged in the conversation but it's part of like interacting with the community here i i have i, I can't help but to read the uh chat going on um so anyway with that being said i'm gonna say god bless you guys and uh we'll do it again very soon shalom shalom peace peace